Good morning, everyone. We are ready. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to the fiscal 2021 preliminary budget hearing for our libraries. This is the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. Uh, we're first going to be hearing from our three public library systems, and uh, there may be one or two members of the public who want to speak on libraries. We have the Acting Commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs uh, scheduled to testify at 11.30, and, and then some additional members of the public who wish to testify on the cultural affairs budget. Um, and I want to uh, welcome everyone who's here today. I want to start uh, our uh, hearing uh, out of respect for the time of the three president CEOs of the library systems. I know other members of the committee will be coming and going throughout the day. Um, and because folks have asked, these are reading glasses that happened this weekend, um, which is a good sign that I have passed 50 years of age. Um, thank you. Thank you. I had resisted it for a while and looked at these papers and really was just making it up at some point. <laughs> so now I'm actually going to read what's in front of me. Um, now that I you can, can see it. it. Yeah. Um, so, so welcome to uh, Dennis Walcott, President and CEO of the Queens Public Library, Linda Johnson, President and CEO of the Brooklyn Public Library, and Tony Marks, President and CEO of the New York Public Library. Uh, and uh, we are now formally in session. So uh, the fiscal 2021 preliminary expense and capital uh, budget for our three public library systems uh, is robust, but could always be more robust. Uh, the administration is proposing uh, $410.7 million for the three systems uh, in expense funding and the preliminary capital commitment plan, uh, which covers fiscals 20 to 24, includes $762 million for the library systems. Now, I'm very proud to be a member of this city council that a year in and year out fights for our public library systems. And we have had some very good uh, years as it relates to library funding for uh, the last few years under uh, uh, this speaker, uh, Corey Johnson, uh, and previous speakers. Uh, and of course, uh, as the chair of this committee and as a member of the budget negotiating team, uh, I fight incredibly hard for uh, our public library systems. So we are also finding ourselves in a period of some, uh, uh, some, some turbulence, and obviously we'll have to see how things play out over the next uh, few weeks and months to see if uh, at any point the budget is adjusted in a way that is not how we would like uh, to see it adjusted on behalf of our uh, public library systems. But for now, uh, we know what's in the budget. We know what's uh, not been baselined. And of course, we know the libraries have uh, additional needs that they are going to talk about. Uh, and obviously, I will be there fighting every step of the way. Uh, last year, the council uh, allocated an additional $15 million uh, in funding for our three public library systems. Uh, that was in addition uh, to a $16 million increase in baseline funding uh, that uh, the council fought for and urged. Uh, needless to say, that $15 million, uh, which is being used for so many different vital programs and services, uh, needs to continue to be uh, included. And I'm sure our three president CEOs will talk about um, not only that funding, but uh, additional funding that is needed uh, for our libraries. So uh, as, it respect, as it relates to the, the capital uh, uh, projects, I know that uh, deferred maintenance and project shortfalls continues to be a concern of all three uh, systems, as well as their uh, 
ongoing need to embark on new and exciting projects, uh, building new libraries, building new expansions, uh, renovating uh, existing libraries, and uh, we want to make sure that all of that work can continue to be done. Uh, it is the council's responsibility to ensure that the city's budget is fair, transparent, and accountable uh, to New Yorkers, uh, and we certainly will continue to push for uh, all of that uh, to take place. Uh, I wanna thank all of the folks, the men and women who work for the public library systems who are amazing uh, public servants uh, at all times uh, and who are the first line of defense uh, and those who welcome people into the libraries. And uh, we certainly will ask uh, at least uh, one question about uh, coronavirus and COVID mm -hmm. uh, and how you all are preparing uh, to make sure that the staff are um, uh, protected and uh, uh, knowledgeable about all that we should be knowledgeable about at this particular time uh, and also how the library systems uh, believe they may be impacted by uh, what's happening in our world today. Uh, so uh, I know that City's First Readers, adult literacy, uh, and uh, so many other things are uh, being funded by the council and all the money that we fought for to include in the libraries. And uh, I look forward to hearing from all three of the systems. And then I believe we may be hearing from some DC 37 uh, representatives after the three president CEOs uh, speak. And then we will get to our beloved cultural affairs uh, after we do libraries. So with that, I wanna thank uh, my staff, uh, Jack Bernadovitz, my legislative director, Matt Wallace, my chief of staff, as well as the team on this committee, Brenda McKinney, our legislative policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, uh, our committee counsel, Brenda McKinney, legislative policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, and the principal financial analyst, Alia Ali. Uh, and with that, I will say that I think I'm a lot more fun when I read off the cuff and I do this extemporaneously, but um, uh, it is also important to read what is before me. So with that, I will invite you guys to testify sure. as you see fit. So it's important to both read and be able to see what you're reading. Yes. That helps That's tremendously. Right. So thank you, <laughs> Chair. I appreciate that. Since these are progressives, it has been a num period of adjustment always as far as glasses are concerned. So yes. good morning. I'm Dennis Walker, President and CEO of the Queens Public Library. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer, and thank thanks to Speaker Johnson and the members of this committee for the opportunity to speak with you about our budget priorities for the next fiscal year. Additionally, thank you for the years of support you and all the members of the City Council have shown our dynamic institutions. It would be impossible for us to meet the needs of our customers without your steadfast support and leadership. Therefore, it is with deep gratitude that I thank you on behalf of every person who works at and is served by the Queens, Brooklyn, and New York Public Libraries. And I gotta, again, deviate a quick second because I was about to sit over there and then Linda said, no, 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 you sit here because you've always sat here, she's always sat there, and Tony's always sat there. And why I mention that is because between the three of us at the libraries and your leadership, we have made a great team, uh, both where we sit and the advocacy and the implementation of programs at the New York's public libraries. And I thank you again for your leadership around that. Without you and others, uh, what we're doing now would not be possible at all. And fiscal year was strong, Tony, you don't have to move. I'm just letting you know what happened beforehand. You're being out with Mix it up next time? Okay. In fiscal year 2019, New Yorkers in every corner of our city relied on New York City's library systems to transform their lives and strengthen communities. We welcomed over 30.5 million people into our 217 branches. Our books, DVDs, magazines, and other materials circulated more than 45.7 million times. More than 4.6 million individuals attended our 264,000 programs. When the city supports libraries, it empowers individuals, it empowers families and communities. Uh, we greatly appreciate Mayor de Blasio's baselining his allocation of $16 million to libraries in the fiscal year 2020 budget. Chief among our expense requests 
request for this year is the reauthorization and baselining of the Council's fiscal year 2020 $14 million allocation to libraries. Uh, through your financial commitment, we have been able to maintain six day service, uh, preserve our staffing levels, protect our collection budget, and address emergency repairs. We collectively hired over 61 librarians, custodians, library workers with this funding, and have plans to hire even more. We increased our collection budgets, enabling us to acquire more books in multiple languages ebooks and other materials. We have been able to address emergencies in our buildings more expeditiously. Uh, my colleague Linda will discuss our important capital needs in a moment. However, for Queens with the capital infrastructure and technology needs that total $491 million, it is imperative to have these expense funds available so that we can make needed repairs and avoid more complicated, costly, and lengthy projects. Public libraries are essential to creating a fairer city. Uh, with your support, we have been able to deliver for the city on some of the major initiatives, such as, as you know, IDNYC, early literacy, voter registration, and currently the 2020 census. In an age when misinformation can spread rapidly in a society where inequality continues to grow, and in a time when a climate of fear discourages new immigrants and others from participating in the American dream, libraries are needed now more than ever before. Uh, we have great fortune of serving in a city whose leader, Mayor de Blasio, Speaker Johnson, Chair Van Bremen, and all of you recognize the value of what we can do for the public each day. In order for us to remain New York City's most vibrant, trusted, open, and democratic institutions, we must continue to have the necessary resources to build upon all of the great things we have accomplished as a result of your leadership. I now turn to my great colleague, uh, the esteemed Dr. Anthony Marks, who will discuss our operational needs and our plans to increase access and expand opportunities for children and teens. Dr. Marks. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mike. And President Wolcott. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and thanks to uh, Chair Jimmy Van Bramer, as always, a huge champion for all things library and all things New York. Uh, as well as, of course, to the Speaker and the rest of the committee and the entire City Council for your continuing strong support. Thanks to that, libraries are doing more than ever, as Dennis described. We've been expanding branches, expanding programs, ensuring an accurate count in the census, and that's just the very beginning. There are, of course, no shortage of needs in New York, and we are particularly mindful of those amongst the most vulnerable in our populations. We are uniquely positioned to help. We're the most visited civic institution in New York. Um, and we are proud, all three of us, all the libraries of New York, proud to do all we can. To continue to do this, as Dennis mentioned, we need $24 million in restored and additional operating funding in FY21. The bulk of that is the $14 million that Dennis was describing that has not baselined in our previous budgets that we rely on. And without it, we will not be able to sustain the gains that we together have made in recent years. In addition, we are asking for $10 million of funding for initiatives, particularly to increase access to our services and to best support the city's priorities. The most notable part of this ask is uh, in terms of city supporting the city's educational initiatives, especially for children and teens. And the centerpiece is finally to request the elimination of fines for children and teens, something that so many other major urban cities have already done with success. We need to eliminate a key economic barrier to entry for many families. Currently, when cards accrue $15 in fines, they're blocked. As of 2019, that meant 60,000 blocked cards belonging to kids and teens. That's 6-0. In, in 2017, when we, uh, when we did a full assessment, 80% of the blocked cards of use were located in the lowest income communities of New York. Those are already communities where we know kids are not reading at the rate, they're not borrowing library books at the rate of the middle class or upper class neighborhoods of New York. And we just cannot let that stand. So we're looking for a solution here. Our frontline staff 
uh, know that there are families in those high need areas who simply avoid getting library cards or checking out any material simply for fear of the fines. We shut out of the libraries for $15 the future of New York, even though we will never receive that $15 anyway. We've been discussing and evaluating this for a long time. We've had read down your fines programs and amnesty programs. We've maintained a fine-free My Library NYC program for eligible public school students. And we know from all that experience, as we know from experiences of our peer cities, uh, that the majority of library patrons simply return their books on time regardless of penalties. So it has no positive outcome for us. It only has the negative outcome for society, for the city, by keeping people from using the library. For instance, in my library NYC, participants checked out 30% more items than their counterparts because they had fine-free cards. So, and after the uh, 2017 amnesty, we saw a 60%, 60% increase in the percentage of children and teens who were previously blocked and then started checking out materials again. The most pronounced, of course, in the lowest income neighborhoods. Um, so we need to get kids reading outside of the classroom, and this is clearly the right move at the right time, if not a bit late at this point, uh, that we absolutely must get to. In addition, we want to launch some new programs and services for helping kids and teens outside of the classroom. At the New York Public Library, we are finally opening a permanent exhibition of our treasures in November. We want to invest in programming and bring this information. We want every high school student in New York, all five boroughs, to come and see these amazing treasures and learn what the library, all of our libraries, can do for them. In addition, in Queens, we, uh, they're eager to have additional funding to expand their popular toddler learning center and their kickoff to kindergarten initiatives. At Brooklyn Public Library, they are eager to expand their Librarians of Tomorrow program, school outreach, ESOL classes, and to increase book drops by 30 at 30 locations. Um, in addition to those educational initiatives, we face rising costs, um, particularly in IT and data-based uh, licenses and maintenance of those databases. You'll be hearing from Linda in terms of the basic capital needs, but we also have non-capital eligible needs and emergency projects, whether it's boiler replacements at our Library for the Blind, HVAC across the systems, um, immediately being able to repair leaks and roofs so that the problem doesn't escalate and end up costing all of us more money, air conditioning uh, at the Schomburg, for instance, just to name a few projects. The people of New York, as you know so well, rely on their libraries and they deserve them to be open, and to be safe, to be in well repair, and to be inspiring spaces. Your investment over the last years has made the libraries strong. In fact, just last year, the New York Public Library saw an increase of 23% in new card holders joining the library. There is great momentum here. We need to maintain that momentum as well as in our capital projects. In this era, which Dennis made reference to, so many of our democratic ideals are being attacked. And New York City's dedication to one of the foundational elements of our democracy, to libraries, is as strong a statement as well as a reality as this city and its city council can make in terms of investing not only in the future of our citizens, but in the future of our republic. We ask you to continue that investment, and we thank you. And now I turn to Linda Johnson. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Chairman Van Bramer, as well as Speaker Johnson, Majority Leader Combo, and Chair Drum, and members of our Brooklyn delegation, and the entire City Council for supporting New York City's libraries. We appreciate your efforts to ensure our libraries remain safe, welcoming spaces for all, a mandate that has never been more important. 
and I echo my colleagues' requests for the city's continued support, perhaps most uh, vehemently uh, about the Find Free initiative that we're all particularly excited about and feel an obligation to be able to offer to the citizens of New York City. Our desire and yours, I'm sure, is to serve the public at the level they've come to expect and that they deserve. Today, we submit our fiscal year 2021 tri-library budget request, $10 million in new operating funds and $14 million in restorations that were not carried through in the preliminary budget, along with a capital request of $300 million, $100 million for each system. Now, the next paragraphs of my testimony, you could probably repeat to me verbatim. <laughs> I've, um, I've decided to take a page from Dennis Walcott's playbook um, and say it's in the paperwork. And the fact is, I just can't sit here and once again talk to you about leaky roofs, about HVAC systems that cost five times more than they should to repair or to replace about the $500,000 in expense funding that I had to spend on capital projects last year, about the $52 million that the Brooklyn Public Library has in shortfalls, and I think that my colleagues have uh, similar numbers, 100 million in one case and 50 in the other. Um, the, the testimony in today in 2020 is exactly the same as it was for the last five years. Now, five years ago was a high watermark when we were included in the five-year plan and truly, 10-year plan rather, and truly that made um, an enormous difference to us. Um, and so we uh, were not in a capital plan year, but um, as a result, we need $100 million for each system to make up for the fact that we haven't been able to do long-term planning. Um, I don't want to... Uh, whine and complain because um, there is some good news. Um, and so while we have emergency needs and we have priority projects that need funding, um, there are a few projects where we have the funding to approach buildings comprehensively. And in those cases, we've made a lot of projects, a progress. Um, Eastern Parkway, New Lots, Canarsie, Brownsville, and New Utrecht libraries, for example. Full-scale renovations like these are only possible because of that one-time inclusion of funds in the city's 10-year capital plan. Um, we're proud to be including interactive public sessions and design charrettes for these projects, a first with our DDC-sponsored projects. And for the first time in more than 50 years, we are adding new and improved libraries to our portfolio modern and inspirational facilities able to support the countless ways people use libraries today. But these priority renovations and projects meet our technology needs. Sorry. Uh, but these projects are too few. Our forecast for uh, fiscal year 2021 includes 35 million in priority infrastructure projects and branch overhauls. Without funding to meet these needs, we risk backsliding on all of our progress. We know what needs to be done to maintain our physical plant. For example, we're transforming a languishing infrastructure upgrade at Walt Whitman Library into a much needed full building renovation. Initially, this library was uh, need in need of an HVAC system uh, and a fire safety and accessibility, but the project now includes a new garden space, exterior restoration, and interior upgrades. And as you've heard me testify about in the past, the proceeds from our Brooklyn Heights Library redevelopment, an additional fund from the state's downtown revitalization initiative, we will be able to re renovate and reconfigure the main floor and meeting room to maximize space for patrons. Through, through, though we are working hard to piece the funding together, the project needs an additional $5.5 million in construction costs to move forward funding that we had hoped would be included in the January plan. In just a few weeks, Brooklyn Public Library will welcome Greenpoint residents back to a stunning new facility. The Greenpoint Library and Environmental Education Center has been completely rebuilt from ground up and will offer increased indoor and outdoor space, expanded programs, and special collections. 
and the Civic Commons, a brand new public space created in Central Library, will be open in time for Census Day. It will house a passport office, IDNYC office, and bring together community and civic engagement programming at the library. We would like to be celebrating more achievements with you. And while there is no easy solution to our capital predicament, we have demonstrated our ability to make the best use of the city's investment in libraries. We urge you to advocate for a robust capital allocation for libraries in the 2021 budget. $300 million shared among our systems will allow us to fill our shortfalls, advance priority projects, and improve branch technology. We also look to you to solidify the city's investment in libraries by restoring and increasing operating funds by $24 million. New Yorkers are relying on you to ensure that libraries, our most accessible democratic institutions, remain strong for all who come through our doors, and that, as promised, they remain wide open for everyone. New York City's libraries are and always will be for everyone. Together, our systems are working with the city and community partners to make sure everyone counts in the 2020 census and that we continue to be a source of endless wonder for children, a provider of hope to the unemployed, a place of discovery and learning for whomever has the inclination to walk through our doors. Help us continue to fulfill this mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to all uh, three of our presidents and CEOs of our public library systems. And I also want to congratulate you for working out the seating arrangement for the dais uh, so, <laughs> so concretely. Um, uh, I also want to recognize that we've been joined by Council Member Francisco Moya uh, from Queens on the committee. And um, uh, so, Needless to say, you know where I am on all of this. Uh, this is the 22nd year uh, in a row that I have been at this hearing. Uh, the first 11, I sat right there as a member of the Queens Public Library staff, and this is my 11th preliminary budget hearing as the chair of this committee, 22 years running. We would say who's counting, but we know. <laughs> And, um, uh, and so we've had uh, some difficult years uh, over that time, and then we've had some, some big victories. And uh, we have, working with this speaker in this council, had some big victories over the last few years. Uh, and obviously we want to continue to build on that momentum, as I think Linda said in her testimony, uh, and make sure that you uh, can continue to do the great work that all three systems do. So I wanted to ask uh, a couple of things, and just because it's, it's uh, front of mind for all of us, um, and I have had some folks reach out to me about this uh, question um, with respect to the, the coronavirus. Um, how are you preparing, uh, you know, the staff and customers? Obviously our libraries are uh, incredibly busy and we want uh, that to continue to be the case, uh, and also uh, in some ways more relevant to what we're talking about today, uh, have you had any discussions or is there any thought to how this might affect uh -huh. the budgets? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we, I think we are all focused on this issue, of course. Uh -huh. uh, there is not perfect information, to put it mildly. Uh, we have to all be absorbing the information as it comes. In the case of libraries, we have to help people find that information. Uh, that is essential both for the continued health of everyone as well as to ensure that there isn't any unnecessary panic uh, over what's happening. Um, just yesterday, uh, the senior staff of the library met after lots of convenings of, of groups of the, of the staff. Um, and we announced that we would place a restriction on all non-essential business travel for staff for the next four weeks, simply as a precaution, that we're encouraging staff to reconsider their personal travel. We're asking staff to self-monitor and quarantine, self-quarantine if necessary, 
uh, especially if they've recently visited a CDC designated area or have come in close contact with those who have. Of course, staff will be compensated in these situations. We're ramping up cleaning of our facilities. We're working closely with the city health authorities and, and, uh, and others. Um, and we are preparing plans for various eventualities since no one can fully know. But we need to be ready when those eventualities break um, in whichever direction so that we, uh, we know we have a game plan and that's exactly what we've been developing. So at Queens, we put out an all, mem uh, all staff memo uh, laying out basically what Tony just said as well as steps that people should take. We talked about, the, and it's, as you know, a fine line because you gotta be responsive and make sure we're always sharing information. So we plan to post more information on our website. Uh, also, we have the digital uh, pieces in the libraries itself and we'll update people on a regular basis. We plan to do training for both the community as well as staff and so we've been planning for that. Uh, we have our own internal task force uh, that we've been going over a variety of issues. Uh, we've been working, as Tony indicated, with the New York City Health Department as well as the state and also following the CDC guidelines. So we've been very out front around this issue and we are reinforcing the importance of washing hands and the basics and making sure we're fully stocked in that area. Uh, while we clean always on a regular basis, I think you mentioned it earlier in your uh, comments about the areas of concern. I think one of the things we have to be very conscious of is the constant use, say, of the cyber center and how we make sure we deal with that and make sure people understand that it's cleaned on a regular basis and it's sanitized and all, but it's all brand new as well. And so we're very, very focused on always getting up-to-date information both to the staff and the public so they're aware of what's going on and again, having programmatic information available for uh, the public as well. I don't really have much to add to um, the colleagues, uh, to the responses of my colleagues other than to say also that Deputy Mayor um, Bean has been in touch, yeah. um, and obviously, um, as, as usual, we uh, intend to be good partners and, and do exactly um, as suggested. And as I look in the balcony, I see John up there, so we make sure that we have uh, ongoing communication with the union and making sure there's a constant dialogue with our teams as far as the information and listening back as well. Uh, Thank you, that's great to hear. It's also uh, great to hear that the deputy mayor has been in touch and that the administration is obviously working closely. The libraries play an important role in every uh, aspect of our uh, city's life and uh, so too with this moment. And uh, uh, you are always helpful in giving information and actually uh, reassuring the public, all right? Libraries are so trusted, they are such safe spaces and such havens, uh, and uh, uh, just as important that they continue to remain so for uh, the duration of this particular moment. Uh, I wanna recognize you're joined by Councilmember Brad Lander uh, from Brooklyn. Uh, thank you for being here, and- Chair, uh, if I may, just one, I'm sure. sorry to interrupt you, but there's one other thing, especially I think for some of our libraries in Queens and maybe my colleagues as well, uh, if we continue to see the uh, anti-Asian either comments or um, type of uh, environment that's created out there, we plan and continue to do uh, a lot of outreach in the community as well. And I think it's extremely important to have both the visibility as well as the reinforcement of uh, the reality of what's going on. And that includes making sure we participate in local businesses and restaurants in the community as well. And I think that's an important point for all of us because there are those who just want to spread misinformation and, and really label a group of people. And I think that's bad, it's wrong, it's racist. And we have a responsibility to make sure we, the libraries, continue to be out front around that. So I just want to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, just to reinforce that point. Absolutely, and it is so, uh Important for that message to come from, from Queens, uh, and uh, uh, thank you for um, uh, pointing that out, uh, Dennis. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the request, the ask. Um, uh, last year we had a great year uh, with significant increases. Some of that was baseline, some of that was not. Uh, talk to me a little bit about, in particular, the $14 million from the 
council side that was not baselined, uh, how was that money allocated? Uh, did you hire additional staff members with that funding? And uh, needless to say, uh, uh, talk about what would happen if you didn't get that money restored? So in Queens, we hired uh, staff, uh, 19 hires, uh, that if we didn't have the money, those hires wouldn't have taken place. Uh, in addition to that, we definitely boosted our collections, and we added an additional $500,000 to our collections, which people truly appreciated, and you can see it on the shelves on a weekly basis. Uh, it allowed us to address emergency maintenance issues throughout the system, and as Linda always testifies about and does it so well, uh, no, I'm being serious about how if those things are not address, they become bigger things and more expensive things, and we have a responsibility to fix them as quickly as possible. So the city council money for us allowed us to really address a number of those areas. No, not all. Uh, it had a significant impact on that. And it also, in Queens, increased our capacity of after-school homework assistance and allowed us to develop our new robotics program and really expand that as well. So both from a programmatic point of view, as a uh, emergency maintenance point of view, and then from a staff hire, especially uh, union hires, it allowed us to do all of those things. In Brooklyn, uh, where we had $9.2 million um, in FY 2020, we hired 42 staff and will hire 13 more for a total of 55. Um, new and expanded branch staff for Adams Street uh, and Brower Park, uh, a wel the Welcome Center at Central, uh, Brooklyn Heights, uh, and a new library um, in the Cultural District, uh, in what we're calling BAM South Site. Um, we've hired 23. We're hiring 10 more in that category. Um, we uh, hired four regional directors, uh, uh, tech mobile drivers, two more to hire, custodial staff, uh, four are hired, one to go, and public safety officers, uh, we've hired seven, um, and capital planning and landscaping staff, we've hired two. Uh, we've increased our collections by $2 million. Um, and we've increased programming and civic engagement programming in particular by $200,000. Um, spruce up maintenance and branches that were not capitally eligible, we spent $800,000. Um, and so um, our overall um, headcount at this time, uh, librarians uh, 359, custodial, 85, maintenance 20, and security uh, 51. Um, TRS, which is a technology um, uh, category, uh, 93. Mr. Chairman, we, um, in terms of the uses in the, in the current year um, of those funds, the, sing the two largest amounts um, were for non-capitally eligible maintenance, repairs, and cleaning, about close to $2 million of that with compliance issues, and a bit over $2 million for library materials. We also, since we've been in, you know, we've been on hiring, though of course that's always met with attrition coming the other way, um, we continue to do that hiring, but in this case we decided to apply these funds towards overtime simply because they weren't baseline funds. We didn't want to create permanent positions that we weren't sure we had the funding to maintain. So we'd be delighted, not just delighted, we need to move this to baseline funding so that we can do those additional hires. Thank you. Uh, needless to say, when we allocate uh, funding to our public library systems, uh, I believe we know that that money is mm -hmm. uh, spent uh, well uh, on behalf of the people that we all represent. Um, and uh, um, obviously, I certainly will be uh, fighting for uh, that money to be returned to the budget. Uh, and the uh, $10 million additional and then the capital ask, uh, talk to us a little bit about, uh, I know you said some in your testimonies, but uh, how important is that 
uh, to you if we're going to keep the momentum and keep building on the successes that we've had. Sure. I'll just reiterate, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, that the the sort of the lead in the $10 million additional ask is the topic we've talked about over the years, uh, which is how do we eliminate the single biggest barrier for low-income kids and teens in New York from reading? And we, if we believe that reading is the gateway to a life of learning and opportunity and taking advantage of that, then why would we maintain a policy that we know is hurting us in meeting that goal, that for uh, $1.5 mil million a year for the three systems, plus another, I think, 700,000 of additional material and, and outreach to kids, we can solve this problem, or at least we can stop hold, tying our hands behind our back to solve this problem. In addition, there's the emergency capital needs and the other educational initiatives that we've described. Um, not to pile on, but <laughs> um, I think the three library systems in New York City are, for the most part, on the leading edge of what's happening in the world of libraries in the country. And when our staff um, attend conferences, whether it's the Public Library Association Conference, the American Library Association, we are more often than not um, presenting as opposed to just listening to other libraries present. And we're doing innovative work um, and it's making a difference not only in our city, but it's making a difference around the country. This particular area, we are lagging, shamefully lagging. And our colleagues have, uh, our colleagues from west to east have all adopted some version of a fine free program over the course of the last few years. Um, this is not a case where we're asking you to do something wildly innovative that hasn't been tried elsewhere. We are very late to the table on this. And, and if I could just add, and I think you very well know this, but just for the public record, a lot of our colleagues and other library systems are entities of government as well. They're government agencies. And so then the government can adjust their budget priorities, whereas, as you well know, and again for the public record, we are all separate 501c3 organizations, so thus the ask is just more important because that type of dependency relationship that we have with you and the city council and the executive side is so important versus it being a government agency and therefore the government can do a rounding error in their budget to address this. So I just wanted again for the record just to reinforce that important point. Thank you. Uh, and there is uh, no one who is both a bigger supporter of our public libraries than myself, but also someone who believes in a fine free policy. Uh, all of you have heard me tell the story of getting my first library card at the Broadway branch in Astoria uh, in the early 1970s, but I don't know if I've ever told publicly the story in this committee that, uh, uh, you know, we grew up with very little money, and uh, I did lose a couple of books, and we weren't able to pay, uh, and, and I remember having my library card privileges mm -hmm. um, uh, suspended and it was incredibly impactful and uh, you stop going to the library right when when you believe you're in trouble or uh, uh, you're not welcome there and reading and going to libraries they're both habitual and if you stop then you stop that progress you stop that uh, lifelong reader from developing so uh, and obviously it's so impactful for communities that and families that don't have very much money. So, uh -huh. um, And the psychological piece, I think, is so important that you talk about because when I got this job, my biggest fear was, did I really pay all my fines and fees? <laughs> and will somebody write that story that the new head of the library system still owes money from before? And so the psychological impact that it has on preventing people from coming to the library and, and the habitual yeah. piece, I think, is so important as far as how we address it. So yeah. I totally concur, yeah. Uh, absolutely. But Sergeant in Arms, they're having a lot of fun in the hallway there. Maybe we could uh, <laughs> let them know that we're actually having a hearing. Um, Chair, Mr. Chairman, can I just say, that, sure. uh, just to reiterate, when we've, so we are late to do this as a policy. We are not late to this issue. We've talked about it for years. 
we've done a couple system-wide amnesties. Um, and I remember when, during one of those amnesties, which was our way to try to get to this result that we hope now to finally get to in a permanent way, I would have people come up to me and say, thank you. Um, I don't even go in the library because I'm scared because I have fines, because I feel that vulnerable. That's crazy in New York. It's simply crazy, and it's, it's unfair, to put it mildly, because you know other folks don't have to worry yeah. about that. And it's the folks who are worrying that we're most worried about. Alice, uh, before I, I go to Council Members Moya and Lander, I also, uh, I think I've told Dennis this story. Uh, when I joined the staff of the Queens Public Library in 1999, they had a program where we all had to uh, go to a library, those of us who were not librarians, and, uh, and do the work of the branch for a day. And, and, uh, and I was at the Broadway branch where I grew up as a kid and I wanted to go there. And for a while I wanted to go behind the counter and check out books. And, and a young man came up to take out a couple of books. And, uh, and a block came up uh, on him. And I stood there uh, behind the desk and this beautiful young child was looking up at me. And I, I told the staff I, I couldn't do it. I didn't have the heart. Right. <laughs> uh, send me to s shelve books now. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and we you shouldn't. overrode the policy. <laughs> yeah, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't be in that place. Yeah. We just shouldn't be in that place. Um, so uh, with that, I want to ask uh, Councilmember Moya, and then we'll go to Councilmember Lander. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Good uh, morning. Just a couple of questions. Uh, President Wolcott, thank you Sir. Uh, so much for being here and the Boy, great work that you do uh, for Queens. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, what is the budget specifically for the Queens Public Library uh, New American Program? Uh, and what is the frequency of the workshops and programming at each of the libraries? Hold on one second, sir, so I can give you a direct answer to that. And go to my program section. And as you know, New Americans has been in existence now for a number of years. Hold on one second. New Americans program, amount of participants, 16,285. And if you break that down, uh, ESOL, 2,509. Citizenship, 767. Immigration legal assistance, 270. Coping skills workshops, 6,257 participants. And cultural of arts, uh, 6,482 participants. Number of programs, 4,962. Uh, and then you have the ESOL. Uh, citizenship program, the Immigration Legal Assistance, the Coping Skills Workshop, and Cultural Arts, and the amount of customers that we've had to turn away have been roughly 969 due to a lack of uh, money available for it. Uh, the total budget, do we know the total budget? And I'm looking to the audience for the first time. Uh, if not, I'll get you that information. Uh, that'd be great. Uh -huh. <laughs> what? Impressive. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. They did a great job. Uh, can you just give me, I, I, I can't leave without asking, can you just give me a quick update uh, on the status of the expansion of the Corona Library? Corona is moving along extremely well, and I must say, and as thanks to your advocacy and support, uh, we have been, really been able to uh, move forward with that. And so right now we're working through the process of getting the various variances uh, for Corona so we can start to build, and I have that information here as well. Um, and give me a second, because I know it's here. There we go. So with Corona, uh, you know, it's 10,500 square feet. We're dealing with the expansion. We have the new house, well, the house that's been there for a while, and talking about the collapsing. So we're well on the way of uh, moving forward with Corona. So this step we're at right now is around the variance process. So we have all the variances in places, so then we can start to work. Great. Uh, 
and then just back to programming, uh, programs that uh, are targeted for uh, immigrant New Yorkers. Uh, can the systems tell us the, uh, about the partnerships uh, that it has with government entities and non-for-profits that provide immigrant, uh, immigration-related information and programming? Yes. Let me start. So I think all of us collectively have uh, relationships with the uh, um, various city agencies around immigrant programs, and uh, we do the partnerships, we do the uh, legal part as well, so the legal assistance programs. Uh, we have a relationship with uh, Know Your Rights and making sure that all of our uh, libraries have that and working with the city and the state along that line. I'm not sure if Linda or Tony have additional information they want to add, but we do a lot of work uh, with the city especially around immigrants and programs for the immigrants. Would, would you happen to uh know how much of the budget is dedicated hmm. to, to that? I don't think I have that separate allocation as far as the city agencies and the budgets we have for that. I'm not sure if my colleagues do. Um, I will just say in terms of the budget um, in Brooklyn, we've increased our world languages budget um, by 46 percent uh, over the past year um, and um, are, are very focused as all the libraries are on ESOL classes, on Immigrant Justice Corps, um, and on the legal front, partnering with Moya um, and the New York and the NY Citizenship Initiative, um, as well as with New York Legal Assistance Group. Councilman, yep. um, so in terms of a direct uh, partnership with city agency, in particular the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. We are participating in New York citizenship to provide free legal help for citizenship applications. Um, we, um, we have the New America's Corners, that are, as you already asked about, in every one of our branches. We've been, uh, recently, we've hosted nine week-long activations of, um, of the uh, Mayor's Office of Immigration Affairs programs. We host Know Your Right forums at branch libraries. Uh, beyond the direct partnership with the city's agency, um, we've helped over 6,000 people achieve their U.S. citizenship through those kinds of preparatory courses. Um, we've had over 700 appointments for clients for one-on-one -on -one assistance. Um, we welcome 15,000 attendees during over 850 programs and services aimed at the immigration community, um, and, and there's much more. Beyond that, more generally, the, as we all know, the libraries are the front line that the immigrant community has always come to first in New York, that feels welcomed and respected. We don't ask for any proof of anything. Um, which is why, for instance, we can be such an invaluable partner in the census, because the immigrant community, we know, uh, the latest immigrant community, because we're all an immigrant community in New York, or almost all, um, it has always trusted us. So that's another example. Or in the English language courses that we teach, the primarily for the immigration, for the immigrant community, which the New York Public Library has increased 600 percent in terms of seats and attendance in the last few years. And I know my colleagues have been doing exactly the same. Just one last question. Sticking with what you just said about the census, uh, libraries were offered 1.4 million uh, for census work in the fiscal 2020 budget. Uh, has all of this money been spent yet? Uh, and if not, how much is remaining? and for what specific purposes? So I'll be very word specific. It's not necessarily spent yet, it has been committed. And so we need to get the money in to actually spend it, but we have committed uh, uh, the money definitely as far as the hiring staff. So we've already hired staff, we've already purchased the tablets, uh, we're doing community outreach, we're going to the hard to count areas. Uh, we plan to have major programs and uh, we're doing something for the youth, I think the end of this week, matter of fact, as far as census reading uh, thons taking place with young people. And so we have really committed to that level of money that we've been allocated, and hopefully we will get the money in sooner than later. So we are definitely moving 100% as far as all of our programmatic goals when it comes to the census. Great. Thank you very much.
Councilmember Lander. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I acknowledge that's true that no one uh, loves and cares about the libraries uh, more than you, but I'm, I'm aiming for a second, so. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and it's great to be here with all three of you and, and have, uh, feel lucky to have had some uh, wonderful engagements with all three systems over the past year. You know, I'm still thinking back to the Stonewall 50 launch, which was remarkable, and uh, Dennis, you know, I, it's amazing. It was just a couple of weeks ago that we were soaking wet during the Lunar New Year Lunar parade New Year. in Flushing. Oh, we're right. soaking wet, but yeah. also, I guess, even though um, some of the first cases of coronavirus had already at that point been identified in China, the kind of panic and the racism that goes along with it hadn't pervaded. And we walked by the Flushing Library and we're talking mm -hmm. about how it's like the, the most active. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, neighborhood library branch anywhere in the country and what like an extraordinary gem it is and the center in so many ways of that community. So um, let's keep that spirit uh, going and I appreciate the work Thank all you, three sir. of you are doing. And of course in Brooklyn, there's r rarely a week that I'm not in the system, uh, both the branches that we're renovating in my district and the ones that are, um, you know, just, just sources of joy in the district. And you know, I'd be remiss in not saying thank you again for the all night of philosophy, which is mm -hmm. truly one of my favorite nights of the year. I got to go hear from Rebecca Nagel and of course the young students of, of Bard and other high schools who got to put on a student run panel this year, which uh, for understandable reasons was maybe my favorite. Um, uh, was really dynamite, so thank you for all of that. And also congratulations on the recently announced merger uh, with Brooklyn Historical Society, which I'm excited. We don't need to spend today's time talking about it, but I'm really excited to learn more and think about how we make sure it, you know, we continue to get the resources uh, to have it continue to be an even more vibrant and open uh, part of our system. That, that library, I mean, the whole building is amazing. That library is incredible. And I think what it can be a part, as part of our whole system is really remarkable. So congrats on that, and I'm excited to learn and hear more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, all right, and um, let's see, so I will, I mean, I heard a little bit of the um, uh, coronavirus back and forth, but I'm, I'm reminded, especially, and this is actually kind of in relationship to Queens, because as, as Dennis knows, my, my wife, who is the general counsel of Planned Parenthood of New York City, they did this great project with the Queens system a couple of years ago. Um, and you know, it had not occurred to me before that how many people would approach their librarians asking questions about sexual and reproductive health, but it's just an enormous number of our people in our communities that don't have anybody to ask questions about basic issues of sort of health in their lives. And so uh, the opportunities for the branch is not only to counter fear, but to be sources of information and like what that means, because obviously if you're anxious, then you're anxious about walking into a public space. So how you make them like from the point where you walk in feel safe and welcoming, you know, communicate across all these languages, you know, how to think in both safe for mm -hmm. your family and your community and welcoming ways seems like a, um, a big challenge and a big opportunity. Um, so I, I guess you had some back and forth on this, but I, I wouldn't mind if uh, hearing just a little more about how you've started to think about how to deploy quickly in order to have your staff able mm -hmm. to answer questions in ways that both give good, accurate information, but are also welcoming and inclusive, and just signal to everyone both that they're welcome and encouraged to come and keep showing up and ask within the guidelines of safety as that evolves over time, and encourage to ask their questions and get answers, which is so much of what we want from our from our libraries. Back to you. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, we are obviously addressing both sides of the coin here, how to operate in a safe way and make sure that the patrons who come to the library are um, as safe as they can be, um, while at the same time, and this is uh, something that fits uh, within our public health initiative, which we started uh, just a year ago. Um, and when we started that program, we were looking at um, uh, various diseases and topics that we thought should be included. Coronavirus, needless to say, was not one of them. Um, but we have the infrastructure and the team in place um, to add this to its portfolio. Um, but I think the, of course, like as in everything, the library is a trusted source of information. And so um, it's important not only that we are um, communicating accurately, but also consistently uh, with the city's directives. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, Deputy Mayor Bean has been involved 
um, and we are ready um, and will, willing to partner in any way we can to further the city's messaging as well as our own. And I'll, oh, go ahead, Tony, after you. I'll just reiterate that um, what Dennis and you both have talked about, which is it's you know not only it, we need to be informed, we need to not panic, mm -hmm. and we need to not turn on each other. Um, and you know that, those are powerful messages that we need to be a part of. We are, of course, training our staff. We are working through various systems that we've been discussing. We need uh, to be able to offer the advice to people who come because they've always come to us for advice. We need to make sure that our frontline staff, Mr. Chairman, are not fighting about fines uh, instead of helping people on this or any other subject. Um, and we need to make sure that if people choose to, they can come to us for online advice, both in terms of contacting us, but as well as receiving our material. It's yet another reason why we've been working very hard at the question of ebooks and increasing the provision and use of those so that if people choose to stay home or have to stay home, they can continue to learn and read and move ahead. Look, let's hope it doesn't get there, but if there is, if there are any at scale quarantines, what an opportunity to have like a public library ebook outreach opportunity to what we could be doing in our in our time at home. We, we should do that outreach anyway, <laughs> God willing, not for that reason. Amen. And I, and I think that words are so important. So I think like my colleagues, we have great people who are here, who are back at our libraries. And we had a senior staff meeting uh, yesterday and discussion also on Monday as far as the use of words when we're putting out memos to people and being very sensitive about that and really doing some fine tuning on how we communicate both to staff as well as to the public, because obviously we have a job to inform people and to keep the information there, but that balancing act of not scaring people, especially with the unknown. And we work, and I know collectively we work, very carefully around that balancing act because it's important for people to hear it, hear it as far as updated information, and as the chair knows, on our team we have an RN who is part of our team as well as health librarians and other staff, and we incorporate their vision and feedback into this process. And this is gonna sound weird coming from me because I'm a person who doesn't have Facebook or Instagram or any of that stuff, but the importance of social media as well and making sure we ramp up our social media content around this topic so people who are on social media. One of the things we noticed, and I guess you guys know this better than I do since I'm part of the 20th century, is that you know, people really responded to social media videos and the posting of social media videos and trying to incorporate that more and more in our dialogue with the community so that way people hear it, they see it, and it reinforces the value that we have as libraries the trusted institution and the institution that's open to others. And so I just want to put that out there because to me what I found during this process, words really matter and yeah. how we communicate and get to the public. I, I really appreciate you saying that and I think, you know, if if anything could redeem social media from it the ways in which it coarsens and makes us worse and more fearful and more hostile versions of ourselves that is the kinds of communications and inspiration that comes from our libraries that those sexual and reproductive health guidelines you have, like I tear up when I read them. It's if people haven't looked at them, you should look at them. It's, uh, it's accurate, it provides accurate information and it's a gorgeous document. And you know, I joke about that all night of philosophy, but it's kind of true in the libraries as well. Like you can feel yourself getting better as a human being when you're in spaces like that. and this is a good time to be mindful of what an opportunity uh, that really is. Um, so just, I have one budget question. First, I just wanna say, uh, uh, Chair, I fully join the Find Free campaign and would love to work with you and our colleagues to try to make that a uh, priority of the councils in this year's response and our work. Like, this is just such a great opportunity. Um, uh, you know, uh, would that it have been in the in the budget itself? But uh, what an opportunity for us to push and make this a thing that I think New Yorkers really get. But I want to ask about the capital budget for a minute, because I noticed in the in Lyndon your testimony, you're saying that the libraries are not 
uh, included in the 10-year capital plan. Now, this is an off year. There isn't a new 10-year capital strategy, but you know, four or five years ago, whenever it was, there was all this fanfare. We were for the first time including the libraries in the 10-year plan. There was new money in the system headed out for the years, so we didn't just keep doing this thing or we just roll this year's money to next year's money and pretend that's a new commitment. By my read, in, in for FY21, there's, there's four and a half million dollars of new money and capital for the library systems in the preliminary budget. So what's going on here? Like, well, this doesn't seem to me to be living up to the fanfare and commitment that the administration made with the systems a couple of years ago. And I mean, of course, we'll push for more capital for the systems and 100 million for each of the systems seems very reasonable to me. But I, I guess before we just dive in, why, where are we, does this, Am I wrong that this reflects a, something of a walking back from that ambitious planning and pushing together? Um, yeah, let me just ask that. Sure. So um, the 10-year plan uh, was five years ago, and um, each of us uh, committed to overhauling five libraries for $100 million, 20 for each. Of course, it, at this point, five years later, costs a lot more than $20 million to overhaul a, a library. But, um, and there was a lot of fanfare, as there should have been, and the it work was, great. Yeah. was terrific, and the work that we've done and are in the process of doing um, is making an enormous difference in the communities. So um, that's all great. The problem is it happened one time, um, and then we went back to our same old ways, which is basically receiving about $15 million a year in capital money to take care of a ridiculous number of square feet, and not only the square footage, um, you know, if you look at $15 million over in Brooklyn's case, 1.2 million square feet, that nobody would say that's possible. Um, but it's also buildings that are small, so that's a lot of roofs. That's not, uh, that's not two or three roofs, that's 60 roofs, 60 boilers, 60 HVAC systems, um, many multiple, you know, complicated systems. Oh, and we've seen the consequences like at Windsor Terrace, where if the money for the roof and the money for the HVAC aren't put together at the same time, then you have to close the library two, two different, different times, times and everyone yeah. exactly. is frustrated. And, and, and there are also the things that I didn't talk about, but the unexpected closures because a system fails, that's a terrible thing. But I mean, I, I think that, you know, the, the thing that, uh, perhaps speaks the loudest is the fact that in 60 li with 60 libraries, we currently have 90 different projects with DDC, which goes to your point. You know, this is just not the way to operate. Um, and with $15 million and, um, and no ability to plan for the future, um, we end up addressing emergencies and taking care of problems when they are at their most expensive because we don't have the money to do the maintenance or even to address things when they're initially um, discovered. So I've become so adept around the issue of capital. I never, my wildest dreams imagine the nuances involving capital and the building of libraries and the repair of libraries and what it actually means. It's a complicated process. I'm glad to know it's invaded your dreams as well. It has, yes, no, the it's my intricacies ultimate of capital project dream in life I'm embarrassed to, be to admit how often having the them. capital issues always in front of me. And luckily, again, we have great staff. I have my VP of capital as an architect and has developed a great relationship with the city, but there's always shortfalls. Um, they're always the unexpected. I think one of our most complicated projects is about to come up and talking about keeping me up at night, it will keep me up at night because it's something not a building of a new library, is putting a new elevator in Flushing. And we can't close Flushing. Yeah. And so how do you scope out a plan to put a new elevator in the Flushing Library, the busiest library in the country, and maintain the services and the shortfalls that will exist with that? And shortfalls and shortfalls and shortfalls and what it means. So, you know, I, and I know that the, you, the council members, get tired of us when we come around asking for more money and more money and more money, but it's the reality of both the cycle of the budget and the increasing well, of costs, but also the shortfalls that exist and how we have to plug that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as Dennis was talking about flushing, the same is true at the Central Library. We're in our most ambitious ever um, renovation uh, project there, and we're committed not to closing the library at, at any time. Um, elevators, uh, uh, infrastructure, you name it, we're touching it, um, but we will not close. 
And I think that, uh, as Dennis said as well, the shortfall issue is dramatic. And I don't know if you were here for my testimony, but the fact is that between the three library systems, we have right now over $200 million in shortfalls. Um, at 100 in Queens and over 50 um, at each of our systems, MYPL and, and Brooklyn Public Library. Shortfalls for previously funded projects right. that have come in at more expensive and additional capitals needed just to fund projects we yep. already in, in some cases had to finish funded. projects, right? To finish projects that have started and um, and you start to borrow, you know, from Peter to pay Paul, and it, it's a it is an absurd game because it ends up costing so much more to do the work. Yeah. So my, my colleagues have addressed the specifics. Um, and, you know, despite all that, we're making incredible progress. And really, hats off, you know, at Brooklyn and Queens, mm -hmm. I know that my team, the, the team at the New York Public, is doing incredible work. And we're starting to really see that on a system-wide basis. But that is despite, instead of because of, some aspects of how this city administers and has long administered its capital projects. Yeah. And I would just say, as a former political science professor, something is wrong here on a system level. And we've been saying this for years and years. And nothing would make us happier than to partner with the city council and with the administration to try to think of alternative ways to solve this problem so that we can get these jobs done. Instead of paying twice as much, taking twice as long, let's get these jobs done and use the citizens' dollars for effective investments and capital improvements. So I'll, I'll turn it back to the chair here. First, I do have like a political science podcast that I listen to about the challenges of capital projects management that I'm going to forward to you. Please, please uh, do. <laughs> we did just pass a bill here uh, to get all of the city's capital projects online in one tracking database so we can start to even diagnose the problems in the system because right now we don't even have the information available to do it. Um, and I know this is another thing that the chair is passionate about, so let's just work, uh, you know, in the response to, you know, do everything we can not to have, play out the usual game where we, like, at the end put a little money in for capital, but do all we can to, to address this together. So thanks to the three of you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Lander, for your love of our public library systems as well. Uh, and um, I just want to say, I, for one, uh, do not get tired of you coming back and asking for more money every <laughs> year, uh, because that's exactly what you should be doing uh, on behalf of the people that you serve and that we represent. Um, and you need that funding. And that announcement was historic uh, five years ago, uh, but we need the administration to uh, continue to commit and recommit and recommit to actually finishing the job. Uh -huh. Just starting it uh, was a very good and historic move, but you have to finish what you started when it comes to building, rebuilding, repairing, renovating, fixing our libraries. Um, so uh, all of that has to be done. To the Fine Free program, I just wanted to ask, what is your specific dollar uh, amount or figure that you associate with us being able to achieve a fine free public library system? Again, it's uh, $1.5 million to cover the lost revenue for the three systems and another $700,000 to ensure the collections and the, and the uh, programming to make that work. So it's $2.2 million Total. citywide. Citywide, that's all it takes. To Eliminate fines and fees. But it needs to be, we need it baseline, baseline. because it's an ongoing part of our budget. I understand that it's an ongoing situation, but it's just $2.2 .2 million. Correct. That, in the grander scheme of things, um, is so incredibly worthwhile. Um, and would, it's one of those things where it's a relatively small amount of money that would make an enormous difference. Right? Sometimes you need a lot of money to make a big difference. This is a relatively small amount of money that would absolutely uh, be a game changer uh -huh. uh, in how we approach uh, public library service um, and services. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, can I just go back uh, sure. for a second, just on the 10-year capital plan, while that was a fabulous historical move, um, we've missed two cycles to add to it. While we are here asking, as Linda has eloquently described, for $100 million for each system to keep us going, to not lose the momentum, 
Um, we are very focused and, and look forward to working with the administration that has been taking the lead on this to really use the opportunity next year, which is the year in which it opens again, to fill the 10-year capital commitment so that we can continue with the momentum that I think has made all of us proud. That would be a great legacy for Mayor de Blasio to uh, leave for the city of New York. Uh, I know we've been joined by Councilmember Mark Jonai from the Bronx, Councilmember uh, Joe Borelli uh, from Staten Island, uh, and I believe Councilmember Jonai has a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, the much-awaited Westchester Square branch, I believe the budget calls for $32 million. Can you give us an update us on this project, or is it fully funded? Are we ready to start putting the shovels into the ground? And if not, uh, what is it going to take? Well, Councilman, first, uh, I, I, I love the question and appreciate your patience, though we've all had to be way too patient on this one. This has gone on way too long, and you know we're delighted by the progress we're being, we've made, and a th thanks to your support. Um, the plan, as you know, is a brand new 12,000 square foot uh, branch library, and we do, we, work, we have experienced significant cost overruns because of how long this has taken, going back to our previous discussion. The project is now, I'm very pleased to say, fully funded. We're working with DCAS and DDC to purchase the property from the Huntington Free Library and to review the design in light of delays. We know this has always been a complex project. In some ways, perhaps it was envisioned in too complex a way in terms of the various missing pieces that have taken us years to bring together. Um, we, we did and that meant the subdivision of a lot, the creation of a new tax lot, the purchase of property, and the demolition of an existing building. But this project remains a priority for the city, for you, and for us. And we're continuing to work with DDC, DCAS, and the Law Department and DOB to get this done. It's way past time. It certainly is, and I couldn't have said it better myself. When will that contract be signed? When will we close? What do we need to do? There's no moving forward. There's no discussion of designs until the sale takes place. We are working as hard as we can with our colleagues at DCAS to, to get to that result. And as soon as we do, you'll be the first to Is know. Is there a time frame? My constituents want to know. Uh, everyone keeps asking the same questions. Is there any type of time frame? We hope that we will get that resolution of the key remaining piece somewhere in about the six-month window, and then we'll be able to move. That's our aim. That's what we've been told, and I hope we will be able to keep to it, sir. Can I ask that you keep me in the loop of things? If there's any Absolutely. surprises or issues, I can help we, We're expedite. all in this together. <laughs> Absolutely. I want to help expedite this. Thank you, sir. If I can play a role in it in any way or fashion, I'm happy to do so. My uh, next question, um, constantly we get requests from our libraries as council members for the limited discretionary funding that we have available. And we know how important these libraries are to our communities, and we want to make sure we're there for them. When we look at the budget of $96 billion and compared to the very limited discretionary funding that council members have. There's an unfairness here. And the wants and the needs and the, the demands are so great that I can't fund any of the projects, aside from some minor door renovations, uh, ramps. And it's amazing that we're still looking to have ADA compliance issues. I mean, isn't this a city and government responsibility and not individual council members' responsibility? What are we doing to bring these properties up to full ADA compliance oh. and in a manner that they warrant to be upkept? So um, we, co we couldn't agree more. Um, because of the age of, of many of our buildings, of our 92 facilities, we have 15 that are not fully compliant. We, are curr we currently have projects 15, in under 15, one five, sorry, apologies. We, um, we currently have projects approved or in process 
that will reduce that by, I, it's either seven or eight, so we're about to cut that number in half. But in this day and age, there shouldn't be any, and we, we're eager to get this solved. It's gone on way too long. Um, and so you have my absolute agreement on that front, sir. But it's not, we can agree on the importance of it, but dragging it out for this period of time is unfair to the disabled, the ADA community. It is an injustice that we are allowing to happen. I, I, I totally agree. One of the ways that we can do this is when we get robust funding in the 10-year capital plan, which we were just discussing, when the city council works with us and the administration to get us the $100 million per system of capital requests that, that Linda was describing, that way we have the resources to solve these problems system-wide. Otherwise, we keep doing sort of band-aids, we keep doing one-year approaches. They don't, you know, we, we can't get in front of the problems unless we have the resources so that we can do it in a planful way. So what is the dollar amount, if you know it, to bring these 15 libraries up to ADA, ADA code and compliance? So I will get you that number specifically, sir. Chairman, I'm gonna ask Chairman that we follow up with this. Um, it's an injustice to this community. Uh, it's been too far, and I don't think that number is going to be as significant as many fear, and it must be a priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member, for your passion for uh, your libraries and all the libraries, and we will indeed follow up and continue to put pressure on the administration to do what is basic and right on behalf of the people of the city of New York, which is to make sure that our capital program for all of our public library systems are adequately funded. Um, <clears throat> I believe the uh, Cultural Affairs Commissioner, acting Cultural Affairs Commissioner, is uh, on uh, her way. But I did want to uh, ask Dennis if you have an update on Court Square. I do, in that we are submitting our lease requirements to the landlord. Uh, that we are looking to move into and then get feedback uh, from the landlord on what we're saying are our requirements from a lease perspective. And uh, hopefully that'll turn around within the next several days to a week or so. So yeah, we're zeroing in on one in particular and so that will be going out. Uh, that is a good update. Obviously we will stay yeah. uh, in close uh, consultation on that. Um, so seeing no other uh, questions and uh, with the Department of Cultural Affairs imminent, I will uh, say thank you and thank you. Uh, close the library's portion of our preliminary budget hearing this morning. Thank you to all of you and we will obviously continue to stay close throughout this budget season. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. If you were here for the library's portion of the hearing, uh, library folks in the back of the room, please depart. We are going to do the cultural affairs portion of the hearing now. We are going to reassemble and we talked libraries and now we're going to talk culture and thank you very much everyone for being here uh, and I believe for the first time as the acting DCLA commissioner, uh, Kathy Hughes is here, obviously. She's no stranger to the department or to these hearings, but uh, um, we will be hearing from the acting commissioner uh, in a moment. And I know there are many members of the cultural community who are here with us uh, today. Uh, and after we hear from the acting commissioner, then we will take public uh, comment and testimony. Uh, the uh, public libraries, the unions representing public library employees have one person who's gonna speak on behalf of all of them, and John will be the first person up when we get to public testimony, and then we'll hear from the SIGs and some uh, other folks in the cultural community. But uh, welcome to the cultural affairs portion of the Community on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations Fiscal 2021 Preliminary Budget Hearing. Uh, and this is my 11th year as the chair uh, of this committee through this budget process, uh, a process that has seen some significant victories on behalf of the community that we all know and love. And uh, it was last year when Commissioner Finkel Pearl uh, departed that as he departed, uh, was very proud to mention that the budget for the Department of Cultural Affairs was the highest that it had ever been in the history of the Department of Cultural Affairs. Something that I am uh, equally proud of uh, because we all worked uh, together on that, the council, the administration, uh, myself and Tom. Uh, and as we await the appointment uh, of a uh, permanent cultural affairs commissioner. Uh, we are fortunate to have the very talented and dedicated staff at the department uh, uh, keeping things uh, running and going at the department. Uh, so right now the budget uh, for DCLA stands at 148.1 uh, million and the preliminary capital commitment plan uh, includes $1.1 billion for our uh, culturals uh, from uh, fiscal 20 to 2024. Um, but what we uh, need is some more baselining uh, of the uh, expense and capital budgets. Uh, we need to be mindful of any uh, potential pegs uh, and uh, cuts uh, that uh, we saw um, the director of OMB not rule out um, for uh, agencies. Um, and of course, there are you know, tens of millions of dollars in city council cultural initiatives, which of course I'm enormously proud of, that uh, uh, we once again need to uh, fund so that CASA and SUCASA and cultural immigrant and other amazing programs continue uh, in the robust way that we all want and need them to be. Um, we also need to make sure that that funding is getting dispersed to the organizations uh, in a timely manner. And I certainly will be asking uh, the acting commissioner some questions about that. Um, whether or not we're getting the funding out in a timely manner to all of the recipients of uh, CDF and, and uh, all the council uh, initiatives as well. So 
we are um, anxious to get to work once again on what I hope will be another very successful budget for the department and for our cultural community in the city of New York. And obviously, you have my unyielding commitment to uh, be a fighter for this community, as I always have been, and uh, making sure that the city council continues to be uh, your best and most strident ally. And uh, I know we've done some great work. I know we have more to do, but uh, I feel good uh, about what's been accomplished and where we go from here. So I am interested to know how the department is uh, functioning, how it's working, how you all are uh, continuing on with the mission, and and uh, with that, I will ask uh, the acting commissioner, Kathy Hughes, to deliver her testimony. Oh, Sorry. thank you very much, Councilmember Van Bramer, uh, and good morning. Um, One second, uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, because we do not swear in the public library directors uh, because they're not actually city agencies, but you do have to be sworn in. If you can please raise your right hand. I'm do left handed, it takes me a second. <laughs> do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions today? I do. Thank you. Good to go? You may begin. Thank you, <laughs> and good morning. Um, Chair Van Bramer, I feel good about what's been accomplished so far as well, and I thank you for your role in all of that. Um, I'm here today to testify in regards to the mayor's proposed preliminary budget for fiscal 2021, and I'm joined by a number of my colleagues here at the agency, and I'm actually going to point them out for you because I am very proud of the committed and capable staff that work at DCA. This is just a few of them. Terry Richardson, who is the assistant commissioner for the Cultural Institutions Group, Ryan Max, who's our director of internal affairs. Uh, Harriet Taub, who is Director of the Materials for the Arts Program, a program I know you love um, deeply. And Say Kim, who is our ACO. Amanda Jacobson, and uh, Amanda Jacobson, who's with our Council's Unit. Angela Blocker, who is the Director of the uh, uh, Capital Program. Kendall Henry, the Director of Percent for Art. Pranitha. Ragavan, who is the general counsel, and Shirley Levy, our chief of staff, and not last or least, Sheila Feinberg, the newest member. You may recognize Sheila from her days at the Department of Finance, and she joined us as deputy commissioner just a few months ago. We're really happy to have her. Back at, who else is here? Dion is here. And, oh, Philippa, you're hiding behind someone. And Philippa Shaw, our director of finance. Um, and Dion Sonogram, who is also in the commissioner's unit. So back at 31 Chambers, there actually are a few people left, and at Materials for the Arts in the warehouse in Queens, and everyone else is doing uh, the work of reviewing applications and preparing payments and moving materials and taking care of business. So we're happy to be here. They may be called on to help answer some questions. Uh, I'm going to start with a review of the figures from the preliminary budget. The FY21 DCLA preliminary budget is, as you mentioned, just shy of $148 million, 147.6 to be exact, and that includes $105.7 million for the Cultural Institutions Group, $28.6 million for the Cultural Development Fund, $5 million in baseline funding increases that will go to supplemental cultural, to supporting cultural organizations as part of Create NYC and other agency priorities, $1.25 million for energy at groups that are on DCLA property, and $7.1 million for agency operations and other expenses. As you know, at this point in the budget process, these figures do not include any one-time additions that are typically added at budget adoption, such as the city council initiatives that you referenced and city council member items, as well as some mayoral increases. It's also comparable, this figure, to the preliminary budget proposed for the agency over the last several years. For fiscal year 2020, our budget is currently $212 million. That's a slight increase from the budgeted adoption due to a handful of technical adjustments. And as you pointed out, this is the largest city allocation in the agency's history. It's an achievement we owe in no small part to our close and valued partnership with the city council. 
Work on distributing fiscal 21 funds is already underway. The deadline to make an FY21 capital funding request from the borough presidents was last Friday. Applications for council support and mayoral capital funding are due on March 24th. And to date, we've received 113 requests from over 90 organizations, and those requests total more than $500 million in capital funding. And we anticipate this number will grow somewhat as we approach the March 24th deadline. Our capital team is already hard at work reviewing these applications. Currently, the agency's five-year capital plan allocates $962 million to ongoing projects at more than 200 cultural groups. These critical investments go to everything from theater seating to purchasing pianos to construction of whole new facilities. And the agency also routinely, routinely provides capital funds for decidedly unglamorous projects that are essentially running cultural facilities and they are critical to running those facilities. Things like boiler replacements and HVAC upgrades. Recent and upcoming highlights from our capital portfolio include at MoMA PS1 in Queens, city capital funds, which are supporting a boiler replacement project. That's an upgrade that will ensure a safe, comfortable, and stable environment for visitors and for artwork. The project is fully designed in construction, and construction should begin later this year. And to my point about unglamorous projects, no private donors were rushing in to put their names on PS1's boiler, so we're glad to be able to invest city funds in this important project. The Bronx Council on the Arts building renovation project was city funded in full with $8.6 million. It includes the gut renovation of the building previously used as a bank branch, redesign of the entrance for a better street presence, creation of a small reception area, administrative space for up to 25 staff, and some large, flexible, multi-purpose event space on the street level, and more. The project was substantially completed last February, and this new home for the Bronx Council has elevated the group's presence in their community. At Louis Armstrong House Museum, also in Queens, we're providing funds for a new 14,000 square foot education center, which will include a state-of-the-art exhibition gallery space, as well as a 68-seat jazz club. The organization's research collections, currently housed at Queens College, will be moved to a new archival center on the second floor of this new facility. And the project has secured LEED Gold certification. Supporting environmentally sustainable capital projects has long been a priority of DCA, and even more so following the Create NYC Cultural Plan's commitment to increase such investments. In Brooklyn, we were thrilled to help break ground on the much-anticipated L10 Cultural Center last year. Adjacent to Mark Morris, the Center for Fiction, BAM, and others, this new facility will house 50,000 square feet of cultural space. That's more than an acre. Where once there was an empty parking lot, in the not-too-distant future, you'll be able to attend exhibitions and performances at Mokata's new home, or see a movie at one of BAM's three new theaters, take in a performance at 651 Arts, or visit a new branch of the Brooklyn Public Library. In Manhattan, major city capital investments will transform two institutions. At the American Museum of Natural History, the new Gilder Center, designed by Jean Gang, will be a major new hub for education programming and much needed space for the museum. And at the Studio Museum in Harlem, a whole new facility designed by David Atje will give this remarkable organization a platform for connecting artists and audiences for generations to come. These are just a couple of examples for projects that have come in all shapes and sizes, helping to ensure that New Yorkers have access to the most remarkable cultural facilities, no matter where they live. And let's turn now to some updates on agency programs and initiatives. Applications for the Fiscal 21 Cultural Development Fund were due February 18th. We received over 800 applications for funding, and this was due thanks in part to the workshops that the agency hosts across the city. Over 300 people attended those, and we also, for our first time ever, did an application webinar for anyone who couldn't attend a workshop or who wanted, after a seminar, to brush up on some aspect of what we presented at the workshops. Um, those are application-based. And the annual peer panel review process will begin March 26th and will continue over the next four months. 
As always, we appreciate and rely on the City Council's collaboration in this effort. Your panel representatives bring important community perspectives to the application reviews and to each of the many panels we convene annually. Agency staff will be in touch in the coming weeks to secure council participation on each of these panels. For the Create NYC Leadership Accelerator Program, we received over 120 applications. This is the fourth round of that program. And the Professional Development Program trains diverse mid-career cultural workers to advocate for themselves, to establish supportive peer networks, and ultimately move into leadership positions within the cultural sector. One past participant recently took to Twitter to share their enthusiasm for the program, writing, if you are in middle management for your nine to five and there is an opportunity to do leadership development training, please take it. The programs I've done with NY Culture and others have drastically impacted how I communicate, problem solve, and influence those I work with. And that's been a common refrain from past participants, now 75 strong. In the weeks ahead, we'll convene all past program participants in response to their interests in and our goal of creating space for this diverse peer network to grow and support one another as they become future cultural leaders. We recently announced an open call for the city's next public artists in residence. This pioneering program places artists within New York City municipal agencies, giving us a way to tap into the city's remarkable artistic talent to help rethink our approach to public service. We encourage artists and arts collectives to apply to work with one of the four agencies participating in the 2020 PEAR program. That's the New York City Civic Engagement Commission, the Department of Sanitation, the Commission on Human Rights, and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Those applications are due March 29th, and selections will be announced later this spring for programs that take place through fiscal 21. The current group of pairs are deep into implementing their projects, and we will share updates in program, public programming that's connected to those projects in the months ahead. On January 23rd, as you may know, there was a massive fire that destroyed a city-owned building at 70 Mulberry Street in the heart of Manhattan's Chinatown. No one was seriously injured, thank God, but a number of local organizations utilize space in this community hub, including two cultural groups, H.T. Chen and Dancers and the Museum of Chinese in America, which housed its archives in the building. Thanks to heroic and unflagging efforts, initially of first responders and then of workers from the New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services, the Department of Records and Information Services, the Department of Buildings and others, we are optimistic that we will be able to save much of what was initially feared lost and the mayor is committed to rebuilding this important community space. My agency, and more specifically, the Percent for Art team, has been moving the city's efforts to build public monuments that are more reflective of our city's diverse residents and its history. We attended a community board meeting on Staten Island last month to present the planned Catherine Walker Monument, and just last night, we presented to Manhattan Community Board 2 regarding the planned Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera Monument. We're also working closely with the artists selected to design the Shirley Chisholm Monument in Brooklyn and the replacement for the J. Marion Sims statue in East Harlem. We'll continue to post dates of upcoming public meetings on nyc.gov percent for the remaining She Built NYC projects in the months ahead. Beyond their work on monuments, the Percent team has continued to commission permanent artwork for public spaces citywide. In recent months, we've installed Unity by Hank Willis Thomas in downtown Brooklyn, as well as works by Jim Drain at PS46 in the Bronx, John Elliott at PS398 in Queens, Jiyun Lee Lodge at PS144 in Queens, and Peter Garakis at PS101 in Brooklyn. I'm sorry, I mispronounced his name. It's Garak Harris. We've also recently commissioned local artists for 11 artworks in public libraries citywide. Working alongside our cultural partners, the agency has continued to keep diversity, equity, and inclusion in the cultural sector on the front burner. Last year, we released results of a pilot study from SMU Data Arts examining the demographics of the cultural workforce. Similar to the report we released in 2016, this workforce demographic study indicated that our cultural workforce does not reflect the diverse residents of our city. 
what we were able to capture this time around as a result of a survey that relies on self-reported data rather than human resources files was information on disability status as well as sexual orientation. The pilot study included 65 DCLA constituent groups, and we plan to roll it out to all of our grantees early in the next fiscal year. It will provide a wealth of new data that we can use to better understand and address the barriers we face as a field and to help any organizations in their efforts to employ a diverse workforce. But we are not just studying these issues. We're investing millions of dollars in programs specifically intended to create more opportunities for underrepresented groups. These include the CUNY Cultural Corps, which since 2016 has placed over 400 CUNY students in paid positions at cultural organizations, and the Leadership Accelerator Program I mentioned just earlier. These programs have been created alongside new dedicated grant programs, like Create NYC's Disability Forward Fund and the Language Access Fund. And all 33 current members of the Cultural Institutions Group have created and formally adopted plans and are acting on them to foster more diverse, equitable, and inclusive work environments and hiring strategies. From the elimination of unpaid internship programs to hiring new senior level staff focused on diversity, these plans are already paying dividends. There is a genuine enthusiasm and willingness to do the real difficult work needed to correct these generations in the making problems. We're not gonna fix them overnight, but we're proud of the work we've done alongside our cultural partners so far, and this is still just the beginning. And finally, I'd like to take the opportunity to highlight some of the amazing cultural programs happening this month for Women's History Month and the centennial of women's suffrage. First, I want to applaud the City Council for partnering with the New York Historical Society on the latest portraits added to the Women's Voice exhibition right here in this building. I'm especially pleased to see that a number of women from the world of arts and culture are being honored, Zora Neale Hurston and Alice Austin among them. And the Women's Suffrage NYC Centennial Consortium, which is chaired by the head of the Staten Island Museum, they have a big exhibit coming up to celebrate this, and the director of the Center for Women's History at the New York Historical Society. And that consortium and its members will be putting on performances, exhibitions, and all sorts of activities this month and throughout the year. And you can visit womenssuffragenyc.org for details on further programming. We're working with our colleagues at the Department of Records and Information Services to continue recognizing the 100th anniversary of women achieving the right to vote. And in this election year, that could not hold more meaning. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, um, Commissioner. So we will obviously begin in earnest the budget uh, negotiation uh, as we proceed down the road towards the exec and then ultimate adoption. Uh, but I want to go back and talk a little bit about uh, what I mentioned in my opening statement about moving money out that was allocated. Uh, obviously, we, we have heard from some of our uh, organizations that uh, funding that was allocated in budget adoption in uh, June uh, has not uh, been delivered to the agency. So can you update us on where we're at and, and uh, give us some numbers on, on what percentage of funding is out the door, is going to be out the door, where are we at with uh, uh, CDF and, and, and uh, the Council of Cultural Initiatives, but uh, I, you know uh, just how important this funding is and folks shouldn't have to take out bridge loans to, uh, to keep going as they um, received uh, healthy amounts of funding uh, and at budget adoption, but if they're not actually feeling it, um, it, it uh, puts them in a very difficult position. I appreciate that, and believe me, uh, having done this for 38 years, I know the difficult position it puts them in. Um, so we are working our very best to move those funds as quickly as possible. Um, when the budget was adopted, we were the very fortunate re uh, recipients of some additional funds that were not expected at the level at which they were received. We had to spend a little time apportioning those. And at the same time, we were also um, 
dealing with the fact that there were a number of staff that were on family leave. Um, I don't think it's anything in the water, but there were people that were out all at the same time that actually had an impact on the timing. We did begin CDF funding as quickly as we could. As you know, any of those allocations that are uh, above $100,000, or actually $100,000 and above, have to go to the controller, and that's an involved process that uh, encompasses many at the agency in preparing that material for the controller and delivering it, and then waiting as the controller reviews that. Um, virtually all of the CDF payments are out the door unless there is some impediment. Sometimes that involves an organization not getting paperwork in. There is a lot of paperwork and bureaucracy, as you know. Um, and we started acting on the initiatives as quickly as we could. I'm not going to tell you that we are as far along with those as I would like us to be. Um, the SUCASA initiative was just finalized recently, and those uh, funds are starting to flow, but they are behind the other five initiatives. The anti-gun initiative is almost totally uh, out the door as initial payments, and the others range um, to between those two. But a number of those were larger this year, as you know. You were very generous as a council um, with the initiatives, and some of that additional money took a little while to get apportioned appropriately and in the budget through the transparency resolutions that it needs to go through. So, uh, you know, we fight, I fight like heck uh, every year to get those increases, and we have seen uh, CASA and other programs tripled and quadrupled, and of course, uh, cultural immigrant created. Do, does the department have enough staff to move these grants through in a timely way because uh, when looking at your, your head count for the agency in the PMMR and, and then of course the dramatic increases in funding, uh, particularly for the Council of Cultural Initiatives but also for uh, CDF now, uh, your, your head count is remaining fairly static uh, and, and that the funding is skyrocketing in some cases. Uh, does the agency have the staff it's, uh, it needs to actually be able to move these grants out as quickly as possible? Would you recommend additional staff to handle these initiatives and to handle CDF? Um, you know, we may have a new commissioner coming in uh, relatively soon, and this is an ongoing issue. It is an ongoing issue, and I appreciate the question. You'll be pleased to know that we are adding four staff to the programs unit um, to help us tackle the work. Uh, it's a good problem to have, right? A, more money is a great problem to have, and we appreciate the great involvement that you have and investment you have made in this process. But we um, have recognized it as something that we need to attend to, and we are adding staff um, I've interviewed several people already, and we hope to bring some on board in the coming month. Um, that's good, and it is a good problem to have that you have uh, a lot more money, but it is, uh, and I know you know this, uh, it is also uh, not a good problem to have for the, uh, in many cases, small cultural organizations that are, that are just not receiving the funding as quickly as they they desperately need it. So I'm glad to hear that there's additional staff coming on board to potentially uh, help with it so that uh, in the coming year, as we fight for even more money, um, we're not um, in, in the same position. Um, so how is the, the department operating? Um, uh, is uh, the day-to-day -day the same as it always is? And, and uh, uh, obviously we've got the senior team here, but uh, um, uh, how are things going, and, and uh, is, it, is it a challenging time for the agency, or, or is everything going swimmingly? It's a terrific time for the agency. Um, I have the good fortune of working with people that are amazingly committed to what they do and care about it. There are people that just are devoted to the field, and you see that in the work they do. Um, you know, I temporarily have moved over from a position where I was in charge of one aspect of the agency, but it's been 
very revealing to me to see the depth of commitment that exists throughout the agency. Um, I don't think I fed you that question, but I appreciate being able to answer it because I really do think that the, the will is there and the capability is there. And the challenges are ones we are meeting. And with your partnership, we'll continue to do that. Yeah. Let me confirm that you did not feed me that question. Um, <laughs> uh, so there's, uh, for the fiscal 2021 prelim budget, there's unallocated baseline funding of $5 million for Create NYC cultural plan initiatives. Uh, when will this funding be allocated and where will it go to? Uh, this too seems like something that we have uh, um, been talking about for a while. We're working on that with the Office of Management and Budget. Um, since it isn't allocated yet, I can't tell you where it will go to, but it will certainly go towards the Create NYC uh, initiatives that were mentioned in the testimony. That commitment to making sure that what the agency funds reflects the diversity of the organizations and the cultural workers in the field is an important aspect of the use of that money. Uh, so Weeksville is going to be uh, uh, joining the SIG family uh, formally. Uh, uh, can you update us on, on, on what's happening and, and what will be happening as a result of that being formalized? I know there's a big announcement uh, next Friday. Um, so talk to us about Weeksville. Terrific. I'm happy to tell you, I don't think I brought the photograph, but um, we documented it this morning when I signed the first license agreement with a new institution in 20 years. Um, the last commissioner who oversaw that was Skylar Chapin. Yeah, right. Weeksville is an incredible addition to the panoply of cultural institutions that belong to the CIG. And we have worked with Weeksville for years and years now on the program side. I'm happy to pass it along to Terry Richardson on the capital side. Um, and we've worked closely with them over the past several months to really look at the planning process that's needed to uh, give that organization some good, stable footing as it moves forward. I believe Rob is here and might be testifying later. Um, I hope that many of us can turn out on the 13th for uh, the actual on-site inauguration of this new institution. And I think it's going to really um, be a terrific asset, not just to the Brooklyn community, but to the city and to the nation. Yes, uh, he is here, I spoke to him earlier, and uh, we all plan to be there Great. for what will be a very important uh, and historic day uh, for our community. Um, so I know we have a number of people uh, signed up. I also know that uh, um, uh, we have, we hope, uh, an announcement of a permanent commissioner coming soon, uh, so I won't hold you too long, but I, uh, you know, I, I trust the agency is as committed to the Create NYC cultural plan and, and its programs that have been uh, funded, because uh, one of the things we're all really proud of is that it didn't, it wasn't just a plan that collected dust on a, on a shelf, but there's actually been real money put behind it. And I know that meant a lot to Tom, um, as it does to me as well. Was it a question? It I agree with was. everything you just yeah. said. The commitment is absolutely there. <laughs> it's a genuine commitment, and um, it wasn't just Tom's commitment. It wasn't just the mayor's commitment. It's all our commitment. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, I apologize. I'm getting used to these new reading glasses thing. I can't get used to them. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I had to take them off. <laughs> um, sometimes I can see everything, and sometimes I can't see anything. So, um, uh, so with that, I just want to say uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Hughes for uh, your decades and decades of service to the department and to the uh, city of New York and to the cultural community. Um, I don't know if we'll be having a conversation quite like this one uh, again, but uh, uh, I appreciate uh, everything uh, you've done for, for this department and for the city of New York. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, with that, we will uh, move to the public 
uh, portion of the testimony. And as I mentioned, uh, I just want to also let everybody know that we have this room until 1 p.m. We have a number of people signed up to testify. So we're going to go to a uh, timed clock. First, we're going to hear from our public library uh, unions that uh, represent public library employees as uh, who are part of DC 37 and only one person will be speaking on behalf of them all so uh, we will give John a couple of uh, more minutes but John Hislop who's president of local 1321 DC 37 representing Queens public library workers uh, and Joe Reese is here from local 374 of DC 37 uh, as well but John will testify and then we are going to go to all of the wonderful people who are scheduled to testify on behalf of the culturals, and we'll do panels, and Taryn Sacramone, uh, representing the SIGs, and Rob Fields uh, from Weeksville, and Lucy Sexton from New Yorkers for Culture and the Arts will be the first panel, and then we will move on from there. And I apologize again for instituting a time clock, but uh, we do have another committee who will be here at one in this room. So John, feel free to begin as soon as you would like. Okay. Um, Chairman Jimmy Van Bramer and, and fellow committee members, thank you for giving my fellow presidents and I an opportunity to testify at this year's Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, Libraries and International Intergroup Relations, hearing on the Mayor's preliminary budget for the three library systems. Val Cologne, President Local 1930, Ronaldo Barber, President Local 1482, John Hislop, President Local 1321, and Joseph Rees here. Uh, Vice President, Local 374, Leonard Paul being the President of Local 374, come before you and united in our request for more library funding. Five years ago, the library, three library systems, President CEOs asked the Mayor and the City Council for adequate funding to provide six-day service. The four unions representing the library's unionized workforce supported this request. Five years later, we are working with these additional hours in larger spaces with more responsibilities but with less employees. As representatives of the library, library's librarians, clerical staff, IT workers, custodians, drivers, and all the other library's unionized staff, allow us to emphatically state that this funding is not enough. We are open more hours trying to meet our customers' growing demands for more programs, more IT infrastructure, more adult literacy programs. Branches are incurring more wear and tear and require more cleaning. They are opening with two public, two public service staff members, and neither are a librarian. Some are operating without custodians. We do not have enough security to ensure everyone's visit and workplace is safe and secure. At the Queens Library, staff are opening branches with two staff members for the whole day. We have staff constantly going from branch to branch because of staffing shortages. In order for library, the library to staff more branches on Saturdays, it has become the norm to request staff to work overtime. Major reconstruction projects that are creating large, modern, and much needed library spaces have drained our human resources. Hunters Point, for example, pulled staff from all over the library system and left to shortages. At the New York Public Library, the staffing count actually went down instead of up as promised by management under oath before this body. At the New York Public Library, there exists a revolving door where staff is concerned. We continue to lose more than we gain, and so staffing levels remain low. We are seeing more of our seasoned staff wanting to leave their a job they have dedicated much of their lives to, and the lack of any real promotional opportunities have added to an environment of low staff morale. At Brooklyn Public Library, similar to my fellow library systems, my, fellow, my members face the, f the same issues, the increase in programs, patrons, and projects, yet not a corresponding increase in staffing. As my fellow presidents have testified, staff are overworked, stressed, and feel unsafe, especially when trying to calm, irate, and handle addicted patrons. One highlight of our low staffing at Brooklyn Public Library is the lack of special officers to maintain staff and safety and security for everyone at the branch. Every Brooklyn Public Library used to have one, but now 29 officers rotate throughout the system, leaving security gaps in all the branches. Our patrons not, not only appreciate all of the services and hours we provide, but demand more. Our members have proven that the printed word and the digital space coexist and thrive. We have proven that our programs and services are vital to our communities. We have proven that it is library, that if we renovate, a library is renovated for or a new one is built, the community flock to us. And when we are asked to aid in civic engagement projects, such as voter registration, the census, immigration rights programs, our members are at the forefront creating a welcoming environment for all. With the collaboration of this mayor, the members of this city council, and our, and our New York City libraries, we have done great things. We need your help to maintain the level of services without exhausting our staff. Please do not fail us. Thank you, John, and perfectly timed, uh, as usual. Uh, 
so obviously you know how deeply I regard our public library workers, and um, uh, so I'm I'm disturbed to hear some of the things that you just reported. Obviously, some of which I know, some of which I don't. Uh, before today, but. Uh, Needless to say, you have my commitment to not only maintain the very substantial gains that we've made in the last few years in particular, but to continue that work and to continue baselining, because I certainly did hear Tony Marks say that yes. they um, did not bring on permanent uh, uh, new full-time employees because of the funding baselining, but there was significant baselining last year. Yes, there was. Yeah, yeah. That I, I believe... Uh, could have allowed for more permanent full-time employees. Certainly the other systems did do that. Um, so we will continue to monitor all of that, but I think the, uh, the commitment on behalf of m me, the council, this committee, uh, is to continue to push for uh, even more and even more baselining, which I hope will address some of the issues that you talked about, although some of it is, is management. Yes, yeah. and, and, and we know that, the, that you and the city council, you and your leadership on the, uh, on the council has done great things for us, and that baselining was integral, definitely for us, but we'd like, we need more. Yeah, we, we, we've gone, uh, and you and I have known each other for a very long time, from places where we uh, had only five-day service, were threatened with less than five-day service, mm -hmm. and then had to fight to get six-day service, then got it baselined, then got additional funding, additional baselining, and uh, that is where we have been for the last few years, which is a very good place, but we want and need even more. Correct, yes. So with that, uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Right, I believe John is representing all of the, uh, the local uh, presidents, uh, Mr. Reese, but uh, thank you for your work, thank you for everything you do for the people of the city of New York. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Jimmy. And with that, we will move to public testimony from some of our great leaders in the cultural community, Taryn Sacramone, uh, Rob Fields, Lucy Sexton. Uh, we are on a clock, so I apologize. We're gonna be moving fairly quickly through this. And then the next panel is, uh, it looks like Siri Horvitz, Valerie Paley, Tiffany Bryant, Desiree Gordon, uh, and then Three more panels after that. Whoever wants to go first, start. Taryn, you're up. Good afternoon, is your, is your microphone working? Is the red light on in front of you? Now it is. It is. I'm Taryn Sacramone, I'm executive director of Queens Theater acting chair of the Cultural Institutions Group and a member of New Yorkers for Culture and the Arts. I'm here today to provide testimony on behalf of the CIG, 34 cultural organizations across all five boroughs. I wanna thank the council for its support. You have been a champion in recognizing the importance of the entire cultural sector in keeping the city uh, healthy, equitable, safe, the CIG works in partnership with the city to make sure that culture is available to all New Yorkers. There are CIG members of different disciplines in all five boroughs, CIGs who bring millions of visitors from around the world, and some of us who know all of our members by name and where their kid hopes to go to college. We are thrilled that the CIG expanded this year with the addition of Weeksville Heritage Center. Our partnership goes beyond culture, whether we're doing census outreach or celebrating World Pride, we are partners. If it's important to New York City, it is a priority to the Cultural Institutions Group. Uh, we talk about employment numbers, we employ 16,000 people, we serve 24 million visitors each year, um, but that doesn't necessarily get at the impact that CIGs have on individuals. So we put a survey out to people who grew up in New York City asking how many CIGs they'd been to by the time they graduated high school. Over 99% had been to at least one. Most of them had been to more than seven, more than nine. One person wrote that because there were not price barriers, I could always visit a place of hope no matter what was going on in my life. We need places of hope that all can access. 
Last year, each CIG member developed a robust access, equity, diversity, and inclusion plan, and now we are focusing on workforce development. We are looking at all levels of employment, and we want to expand that work in a way that is impactful for the entire cultural sector. As you know, numbers? Yes, sure. Wrap it up a little bit. 25.4 million was added on top of the baseline to New York City's cultural budget last year. As you're considering your priorities, we would like to see uh, that that 25.4 million be restored and that strong consideration be given to an additional 20 million uh, to be divided between the CIGs and the program groups and the portion of that allocated to the CIG would go to workforce development. Places of hope. Places of hope. Thank you, Taryn. Great job as the acting, acting leader of the SIGs. Can we just make you the permanent leader of the SIGs? That is not my decision. Right. <laughs> I, love, I love John. I love John. <laughs> but I hear he's coming back since this hearing started, so. <laughs> I look at the Twitter, I look at the Twitter, he's coming back. But, you know, you'd be a great permanent chair too, just saying. Uh, I'm sorry, Rob, that Thanks, was just uh, having a little fun, having a little fun here today as well. Rob. Um, good morning. Um, good morning, Chairman Van Bramer and members of the committee. I am Rob Fields, the President and Executive Director at Weeksville Heritage Center. Uh, as many people know, the newest member of the Cultural Institutions Group, um, and as you are all keenly aware, the first in over 20 years. Um, you're all aware of this, uh, and when I say all, I mean members of the City Council, because many members of the City Council played a significant role in making this happen. Uh, we're grateful for the support we've received from you, Chairman Van Bramer, uh, Member Lori Cumbo uh, in her role as Majority Leader, Speaker Johnson, our own Council Member Rob Cornegie, uh, Junior, Danique Miller, as well as many other members of the New York City Council, want to thank you all for that support. Um, that support allows us to continue working with other cultural institutions across the city, uh, including Brooklyn Museum, BAM, Brooklyn Children's Museum, the Museum of the City of New York, to name a few. In addition to taking our relationship with DCLA to a new level, and again, I want to shout out uh, Acting Commissioner Hughes uh, and her committed staff, um, we'll also be able to continue to deepen our work with uh, NYCHA, with the New York City Human Rights Commission, DYCD, and the Parks Department. Um, why do people visit Weeksville? There are a couple reasons for that. First, Weeksville invites all New Yorkers to learn a little known piece of the city's history as well as its black residents who were building a community of thriving institutions in the decades leading up to the Civil War. And today, Weeksville mixes historic preservation, education, arts and culture, and civic engagement programming in a way that centers black history, culture, and creativity right in central Brooklyn. We're all aware of the positive at, uh, impact the arts has on communities. Um, Weeksville has been engaging youth through partnerships with OBT, Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow, Crystal Ray Academy, and bed Restoration Corporation. And over the years, um, we've given over 20 students experience in working at a cultural institution based in Brooklyn. To address the lack of diversity in the museum field, we've been running an internship program for graduate students in library science, museum, and field and archival studies, and between 2016 and the end of this calendar year, we'll, we will have provided 15 students with valuable exposure to the field, and yes, this is something we'd like to evolve. Rob, can I just ask you to uh, wind it up? Uh, sure. Just because we're under a time uh, constraint here with another committee coming in at one. And Absolutely. Not. So I'm just going to wrap up by reiterating our request for um, support for the workforce development um, to, con to uh, for the FY20 funding uh, to be restored and asking that the $24.5 million that was added last year uh, to be baselined included in this new budget. So thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, and as you were speaking, Alia was talking about the tour for the committee. Uh, and that, uh, no, they went, they went, and they, they loved it. Uh, and uh, I look forward to all being there with you. Absolutely. Uh, next week as well. It's going to be fun. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Lucy Sexton of New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. Thank you, Chairman Van Bramer and City Council members for allowing me to testify and for all the work you do for arts and culture in our city. Uh, we are a citywide coalition working for a city in which every citizen has the ability to engage in the life-affirming, community-strengthening power of culture. Past two years, we've been noted that there's been huge increases. We now have a city culture budget that's bigger than NISCA, that's bigger than the NEA, which is fantastic, but also speaks to how NISCA and the NEA should be <laughs> receiving better funding. Uh, the work of the uh, city's first cultural plan has begun to make inroads in the inequitable funding practices, but more work needs to be done to ensure that artists working in every neighborhood of every borough have what they need to survive and thrive. We've been noting the success of Weeksville, but the fact that it took 20 years for another organization, the fact that it took uh, Weeksville launching a crowdfunding campaign to get our attention, the fact that we still do not have a transparent process by which an organization might become a CIG, these are all areas which we need to work on. This year I want to bring to your attention Arts East New York. They are one of the only cultural assets in that neighborhood. They do extraordinary work providing space for art classes, theater performances, community gatherings. Two of my favorite programs are their farmer's market happenings, where they set up art happening in the farmer's market to get those farmer's markets some traffic. They also convert old shipping containers in a, to, to uh, set them up for artist residencies in a program called Renew Lots. Um, they came to our cultural convening last week in Brooklyn, and Catherine and Bolly Green Johnson, their founder, announced that they would be closing their doors in a few weeks. This is unacceptable at a time when more and more, uh, we are more and more aware of a way that culture affects all aspects of community life. Uh, we cannot be allowing cultural organizations in underserved communities to continue to b live at the edge and to be falling off that edge too regularly. Uh, so we support our colleagues' call for an increase of $20 million to the budget. We call for the reinstatement of last year's $25 million, and we implore the committee to work now to baseline much-needed increases to the cultural budget you have made in the past few years. We know we'll be seeing a huge turnover in the city government in 21, and we want to ensure that this legacy of robust cultural support is protected and built on. Thank you for listening. Thank you for all your work on behalf of artists and cultural organizations across the city. Thank you, and uh, I am very familiar with Arts East in New York, and, and uh, Catherine has been before the committee uh, a number of times. Yeah, she sent me her testimony. She is caught in other <laughs> work and other meetings. I will be submitting the testimony. Yeah, we should definitely follow up and talk <laughs> offline about uh, uh, how we can be of, of help, because she's great, they're great. Um, uh, so thank you. With that, uh, I will dismiss the panel. And just for the record, I love John Calvelli. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, I'm but, telling him. But, I'm telling him what you say. Yeah, but I may love Terrence Sacramento a little bit more, if that's all right. Okay. Um, so with that, thank you to this panel. And we will hear from Siri Horvitz, uh, Valerie Paley, Tiffany Bryant, and Desiree Gordon. If you are here, uh, those four, please come to uh, testify. And the next panel is... Uh, Elizabeth Henderson, Lisa Alpert, uh, Lindsay Malreco? Malreco. Malreco? I'm sure we're saying that wrong. And May Rose? That's from one institution, though, right? Got it. Okay. All right. Whoever wants to start first, feel free to go. Good afternoon, members of the Cultural Affairs Committee. My name is Siri Horvitz, and I'm Director of Government Relations for Lincoln Center. The vision of Lincoln Center is a world where the arts are not for the privileged few, but for the many. Though much has changed since our founding in 1963, Lincoln Center remains dedicated to presenting the best of the performing arts and to reflecting the rich cultural diversity of New York City. Today, we see ourselves as more than an arts presenter. We are also a civic institution with a responsibility to provide artistic experiences that improve people's lives. To this end, we are embarking on a multi-year plan to further diversify our programming and audiences. We are calling this Lincoln Center's 51 District Promise. Our promise is to significantly expand upon existing partnerships and forge new ones with organizations serving seniors, families, youth, and teens to understand the unique needs of each community, tailor programming and arts engagement opportunities, and create a greater sense of belonging. 
A new full-time position will be created to support this effort with a special focus on building connections and increasing arts engagement within NYCHA developments. We are dedicated to breaking down perceived and actual barriers, including new ways to distribute tickets, addressing transportation concerns, and piloting new dining programs. At the heart of this campaign is the new David Geffen Hall, which Lincoln Center and the New York Philharmonic are working together to reimagine for the 21st century. Now more than 50 years old, the hall has passed the commonly acceptable serviceable life for durable structures. The transformation of the hall will not only yield a world-class concert venue, but also public spaces that will serve as the foundation for decades of artistic innovation, community activation, and educational and cultural advancement. The hall's forthcoming renovation is the basis on which we will begin a new era of service and civic engagement and fulfill Lincoln Center's 51 district promise to the people of New York. We are proud to call New York City our home and grateful to the committee for recognizing Lincoln Center's role in the lives of all New Yorkers. We look forward to partnering with the Council and the Department of Cultural Affairs on our 51 district promise and the renovation of David Geffen Hall. Thank you. Perfect, with three seconds to spare. I practiced. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Hello, my name is Tiffany Bryant. I am here from the Public Theater. Um, I know you're very familiar with us, but I will just um, give a little bit of history for the benefit of everyone else here. The Public Theater engages one of the largest and most diverse audiences in New York City in a variety of venues, including the Delacorte Theater and Central Park, and our landmark downtown home in the East Village, which houses five theaters and Joe's Pub. Last year, we offered more than 1,600 performances and welcomed over 350,000 people. Since 1962, the Delacorte Theater, a city-owned structure in Central Park, has been home to free Shakespeare in the Park. Since then, over five million people have attended performances for free. Each year, we welcome over 100,000 attendees, and last year, we welcomed audiences from every zip code in New York City. In addition to distributing tickets for free Shakespeare in the Park from our Astor Place home and in Central Park, we distribute tickets from community hubs throughout the five boroughs, including libraries, recreation centers, and other cultural institutions. This summer, Richard II and the Public Works musical adaptation of As You Like It will be performed during our free Shakespeare in the Park season. As you know, we are planning a revitalization of the Delacorte Theater, which has not undergone a major renovation since its opening in 1962 and was last updated in 1999. This project will allow more New Yorkers to experience free theater. This will be accomplished not by adding more seats or expanding the theater's footprint, but by streamlining operations and improving efficiencies made possible by a revitalized facility. Greater efficiencies will allow us to shorten the time between productions while also addressing ongoing infrastructure and accessibility challenges. Um, I just want to thank you very much for your support of this project um, and the budget for the last two years, and we look forward um, to support this year. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and I appreciate your partnership with the Fortune Society, a uh, great organization based in my district. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Cultural Affairs Committee. My name is Desiree Gordon. I am the Director of Programs and Strategy at the Brooklyn Arts Council. Uh, we are spheres of impact, our creative expression, creative ecologies, and creative equations. Uh, the Brooklyn Arts Council ecological impact in the field is only possible because of the City Council's crucial support, uh, which we use to catalyze dynamic cultural interventions, education, training, incubating, grant making, presenting, producing, and advocating in the concentric circles of artists, audiences, and communities. Uh, we believe in artist power, and so we incubate and invest in artist development. Uh, we aggregate imagination and connect resources for sustainability, and we um, activate cultural assets as solutions for a more just and joyful Brooklyn, a more civically inspired and compassionate world. Um, art exhibitions in East Flatbush amplifying immigrant experiences and intergenerational theater workshops bridging the gaps of gentrification and single mothers returning to creative practice to lead and design workshops for young entrepreneurs tell us that the work is working. Uh, city Council funding is the bedrock on which Brooklyn Arts Council builds these systems of sustainability and ecosystems of equity and we thank you. 
uh, increased regrant funding has allowed us to uh, jump from 26 percent uh, to 46 percent in terms of meeting the, the need uh, that we are seeing in our applications. This is great news for us and for the City Council. It means that together via webinars, technical assistance clinics, and in-person info sessions, we are effectively enhancing the visibility and increasing accessibility across cultures, incomes, genders, disciplines through na all neighborhoods in Brooklyn. Uh, and we ask that you do everything that you can to baseline the funding at or above this new summit so that we can keep pulling more and more Brooklyn creatives up with us. Uh, Brooklyn Arts Council's CDF uh, funding drives our work across multiple service areas, um, from Brownsville to Dumbo, Bensonhurst to Brooklyn Heights. Um, our cultural heritage programs support traditional artists as they navigate city agencies, uh, and we use city fu CDF funding to drive economic and workforce development. Our PD programs resource cultural entrepreneurs with clinics and trainings, diversifying income, uh, preparing taxes, and leveraging technology for business development. Uh, we use the CDF funding to draw wider arcs of relevance between the arts and other sectors, and with greater CDF funding, we can deepen the impact in these areas. Thank you. Sure. Okay. And I uh, went ahead and read the rest of your testimony. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> appreciate the uh, uh, the Casa uh, discussion, and uh, it's a big day in Brooklyn on Friday, March thirteenth. We it's, hope to see uh, you if you can. Weeksville, and then your uh, annual grantee celebration. And before I became a council member, I was president of the Queens Council on the Arts. Oh, wow. So I am particularly uh, fond of our uh, five borough wide arts councils, and of course we have had massive uh, increases to the uh, um, arts councils, uh, partly because I believe so much in the work of them. So I'm glad to see you guys doing so much more with that money. Thank you, thank you. We ask that you baseline it. Absolutely, thank you. Welcome again. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of New York Historical Society, New York's oldest museum. We share the council and administration's commitments to diversity and equity. As director of our Center for Women's History, I know what continued city cultural funding has allowed us to achieve. With generous capital project allocations from the New York City Council and the Department for Cultural Affairs, New York Historical has made major institutional advances, such as the establishment of the Center for Women's History, the first of its kind in the nation. For two years, we partnered with Council Speaker Johnson and the Women's Caucus to mount an exhibition right outside featuring the first ever portraits of important New York City women to hang in council chambers. Important support from the DCA's Cultural Development Fund helps us mount exhibitions exploring the African American experience, LGBTQ plus history and culture, the struggle for suffrage, and the more stories that remain under-examined in textbooks. These exhibitions reach more than 200,000 public school students in our museum or through our in-school and digital education initiatives each year. Our newest program, the Academy for American Democracy, offers sixth grade classes of free four-day residency at the museum so students can become more engaged and active future participants in the democratic process. In its pilot year, we've served 24 classes from a wide range of public schools, many serving a majority low-income population, and our short-term goal is to increase service to 3,000 students annually. At the post-secondary level, to address the pervasive lack of diversity in American museum leadership staff and in the city's museum cultural workforce, we've launched a Master of Arts in Museum Studies, a degree program offered through the City University of New York School of Professional Studies. Almost 40% of the initial MA student cohort identify as people of color. In the years ahead, New York Historical is proud to build on this momentum in a variety of ways, most notably through a landmark partnership with the LGBTQ Plus Museum that seeks to establish the world's first major destination for the exploration of LG LGBTQ plus history. It is the city's continued support that positions us to forge these partnerships and tell these important stories. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Uh, you know uh, my regard for your institution and for the work that you do. And uh, needless to say, I'm thrilled with uh, any progress we make towards that LGBTQ plus museum. As a gay man, uh, it is incredibly important that uh, our stories uh, be told and told uh, again and again. So thank you very much, all of you, for being here today. Uh, next panel, Elizabeth Henderson, uh, Lisa Alpert. Uh, I have Lindsay uh, Malieckel. Uh, and is Mary Rose, but one of you is testifying, right? Or, okay, but we're gonna keep that to two minutes. Thank you. 
Uh, and then, uh, okay, and then Randy, you're gonna, Randy Borscheid is, uh, oh, I don't see him now. What's that? Oh, she's on her way, okay, so then. We will push her to the next panel. So, uh, so Randy so Borshad, you're on this panel. Oh, but that's not you. <coughs> and uh, is Turquoise Martin? Turquoise Martin? Uh, if you'd like to join this panel as well. Yes. So we'll push Elizabeth to the next panel. I've got 20 as well, but those are the first three if you want them. Yeah, <laughs> Elizabeth Henderson to the next panel. Minus, well, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, do we not have enough chairs? All right. Why doesn't the dynamic duo get started, though, as we're waiting? Yes. I'm oh, interested to see I, how the two of you are going to do two minutes. Yeah, we, I've already cut half of it. Uh. Um, <laughs> but you have the full thing in front of you. Um, hello. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you about the importance of the performing arts. My name is Mary Rose Lloyd, and I'm the artistic director of the new 42nd Street where it's our mission to make performing arts and cultural engagement a part of everyone's life from the earliest years onward. In 1995, thanks in part to the generosity and vision of the city, our nonprofit launched, steering the revitalization of 42nd Street by creating the new Victory Theater, New York City's first and only nonprofit performing arts venue for kids and families. Through our international programming, the New Victory is a lens to the world showcasing artistic disciplines and traditions from a multitude of cultures. We believe audiences of all ages deserve theatrical stories that embrace a variety of narratives, art forms, and themes, and that introducing arts experiences that creatively spark imagination serve to broaden a young person's understanding of the world and their place in it. Through our summer dance series, New Victory Dance, we showcase the incredible artistry and diversity of New York City's top choreographers and dance companies with performances specifically curated for young audiences. This initiative provides daytime dance performances and dance education to city-run summer schools, subsidized day camps, and social service agencies. New Victory Dance reaches more than 4,000 New York City kids every summer with free tickets that are underwritten by the New 42. I have 45 seconds? Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna skip to this. Each season, New Victory serves over 60,000 New York City family members with an average single ticket price of $18. We've been championing fantastic arts programming for children since our inception and are looking forward to our 25th anniversary season next year when we plan to highlight our accomplishments while further focusing on greater access to the arts for young people and families. And I'll finish uh, just by saying, adults have made up their mind about the world around them. Young people are still questioning it. We need the arts for young people in order to ask the questions that no one else is asking, to challenge the world as we think we know it. To be a young person is to be a stranger in a wider world that never quite gets you. Um, if we, uh, if it should show the, theater should show the kids that the world they don't know, tell them stories they haven't heard, ask them the questions they haven't thought of, send up provocations for young people to find answers. It's they who must find them, it's their future. Who's next? You keep passing, everyone keeps passing. Why don't you just go? It's like we don't want to do this. Yeah, you're up. I'm at. Hi, um, uh, good afternoon, Chairman Raymer. Um, my name is Lisa Alpert. I'm the Vice President of Development and Programming at Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. Um, I'm excited to tell you how we are reimagining and expanding what this extraordinary historic landscape can be. Uh, for geographical context, we are in South Brooklyn. We neighbor seven different neighborhoods and span 478 acres. Um, we also, uh, we offer an unexpectedly diverse range of cultural and educational programs, including workforce development for jobs in masonry restoration, workshops in environmental justice, major program with Cornell University on how large urban green spaces can fight climate change, and our school programs serve over 4,000 students annually. We host classical music concerts in our catacombs, uh, film screenings, twilight tours, a wonderful Day of the Dead event, a uh, popular nightfall event welcomes about 2,000 people every year for a nighttime odyssey with artists and musicians and filmmakers and about 10,000 LED lights along the winding paths. Um, our trolley tours and walking tours are almost always sold out, including our annual Gay Greenwood Tour, which is co-hosted with our friends at L NYC LGBT sites. Uh, last year, we welcomed over 330,000 people to our grounds. 
Um, at Greenwood, we are creating a new kind of cultural institution for New York City, one that's been right here in front of our eyes for almost 200 years. We like to say Brooklyn's newest cultural institution is actually its oldest. Uh, but we have a problem. While we have hundreds of acres of outdoor space, we currently have no indoor space for programming, which means that most of our programming comes to a screeching halt for about four months of the year. Um, we need indoor space. Our new Education and Welcome Center will expand the community's cultural and educational capacity and allow Greenwood to offer its programming year-round, which is especially important in South Brooklyn, um, a part of the borough that is culturally significantly underserved. Um, while we have raised 65% of the capital needed to fully fund the project, we are seeking public support from the department and city council um, to, to complete the project. project. It's our hope that you will weigh the budget priorities and see the value of this wonderful program. Thank you very much. Thank you. 330,000 people yes. is a lot of people coming. It's a lot us. of people. That's great. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, we can do a lot better. We can do more. <laughs> great. Uh, Brandy, do you want to go next? And then we'll. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair of the committee. Um, I, uh, Randy Borscheid, I'm uh, founding director of the Archive of New York City Cultural Policy uh, because I've been in this field for 40 or 50 years and had the honor and pleasure of hiring Kathy Hughes, who you heard from earlier. Uh, I have a sense of pride. Uh, at the accomplishment that we've all done, but I have to point out that your personal leadership and your colleagues on the council uh, have really led the way in this, and I thank you for this. Um, but not to, and so as, as uh, Commissioner Hughes said, uh, we have the highest budget in history, uh, the highest public budget for cultural affairs in the nation. Uh, we have a billion dollars in capital projects. This represents great progress, <clears throat> but rather than being content, <clears throat> I urge you, and I know you're inclined to think this way too, <clears throat> to build on this important foundation and continue to see this important aspect of New York life, uniquely important uh, aspect, grow. Uh, in particular, uh, I'd like to uh, ask you to think uh, about the capital budget. I know uh, Commissioner Hughes spoke about that. Um, with nearly a billion dollars in place, there are a lot of other needs. Uh, my colleague to the right just mentioned one potential one, for example. We need to build the infrastructure of culture in this city to continue to build it. Uh, with those facilities, uh, we can then do programs which serve the entire population and which do a few other very important things, such as attracting tourists who uh, are a major, major part of New York City's economy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Randy, uh, very much. Yep, you're up. Yeah, I'm sorry. Good afternoon. Thank you, Committee Chair Van Bremer and committee members. Thank you for allowing the opportunity for public testimony today and your leadership on this issue. My name is Turquoise Martin, and I'm a just leadership member as well as an undergrad student at Hunter College. And I want to highlight opportunities New York City has but is not currently taken to immediately invest in the types of community resources that can create safety by strengthening and stabilizing communities. We can do this even with the cuts to the state by beginning the long overdue work of divesting from overfunded systems of law enforcement. Each budget cycle, we, we passionately and articulately make the case for desperately needed funding for housing, education, libraries, and youth programs. And each budget cycle, we only walk away with a fraction of what is needed. This is a choice, and our elected officials have the power to make a different choice. Um, decades of mass criminalization have extracted vast resources for black, brown, and poor communities. And we all want to live in strong, safe, healthy neighbors, and our communities have the solutions, but not the support. So the Build Communities platform it has been updated this month, and it highlights areas of need as well as many programs that are already working. And I'm pleased to share a copy, with, copy of that with you today. But one particular need that I want to highlight today is community programs and services, specifically demands for reinvestments for community-led centers, cultural programs, public libraries, and organizations focused on social justice and activism. When I was younger, I was cared for by family members because my mother could not. My family cultivated my love for learning and reading, 
When I was 10 years old, they passed away and I was placed in foster care. In foster homes where there was padlocks on refrigerators and the children destroyed my books. I um, found a safe haven at the Tremont Library on Wa Washington Avenue. And although, and I would stay there until closing. Although I faced challenges in my life, programs and cultural learning balanced the skills. Today I'm a CUNY grad, undergrad studying Mandarin as a third language. My 15 year old son is a high school student with 12 college credits. We live in the Lower East Side, but he goes to high school in Brooklyn and he attends the Brother Sister Soul program in Harlem. And he would greatly benefit from an unlimited student metro car, right? But we talk a lot about families, but I also want to acknowledge that young people who may not have families and would benefit from the support of such programs and more spaces for mentoring, positive encouragement, and the opportunity to build community they may otherwise not have. I'm Thank you. There. Thank you. Uh, so a lot of people testified today. I think that might have been the most important testimony. Uh, so far that I've heard all day. Uh, a, you could talk about libraries all day for me because I'm a library person. Um, and uh, this is a great story. Congratulations. And thank you for infusing our discussion of libraries and culture with uh, uh, a really progressive social justice uh, and uh, equity-based argument for what we all do for work. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I know that the uh, next hearing is gearing up, but we still have a few more people to testify. Elizabeth Henderson, is Elizabeth with us now? She is. David Johnston, Jennifer Wright Cook, David Nussenbaum, or Nussenbaum, Nussenbaum. Uh, if the four of you are still here, please come to the front, and then we will, and then we have one last panel that has Kim Chan, David Chase, Sophia Allen, and Natalie Correa uh, on it. And that'll be our last panel for uh, today before the next hearing begins. All right, feel free to go right into it, Elizabeth. Make sure your mic is working. Uh, Great. Good, okay, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Elizabeth Henderson. I'm a grants manager at the 92nd Street Y. <clears throat> Many people are familiar with 92Y, you know, a very old cultural and community center here in the city, but a lot of people, when they think of 92Y, they think of our location on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. What less people are familiar with is the fact that we do work citywide with over 16,000 public school students and educators throughout all five boroughs. So every year we work with about 70 different K through 12 public schools to provide free arts programs, both after school through CASA, as well as um, many year long in school programs, uh, providing arts instruction at school and bringing the students to 92Y for performances and events. And we're very grateful to the city council for its support of those programs. In addition to the 70 public schools that we collaborate each year, 92Y is really proud of a network, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have formed over the past two years with 30 different cultural organizations throughout the city. So we are working with those 30 different cultural organizations to produce an initiative that's actually happening right now this week called Teen Arts Week. Uh, it's happening March 2nd through 8th. So Teen Arts Week is um, put simply kind of like New York City's Restaurant Week, um, but instead of restaurants, it's free arts programs for teens. So this week we're having um, teens attend different classes, workshops, performances at organizations all throughout the five boroughs of New York City. Um, earlier this week, we had hundreds of teens at 92Y to watch uh, five different Teen Citizen Artist Awards. Um, teens who have made contributions to their communities be honored for their work in the arts, as well as performances by Urban Bush Women and the High Bridge Voices Youth Choir. Um, later tonight, some teens will be attending an event at BAM, where they'll, where they'll have a three-hour recording session with a professional, look to walk away with a vinyl album and their own digital recording. Later this week, there will be open mics uh, for teens at the Queens Museum, at the Museum of the Moving Image. Um, things are happening all over. We are really pleased to thank see you. Thank you. Yes. We have to uh, move on, as you can okay. see. But thank you very much. We love the oh, 92nd sorry. Street Y. Thank you. Uh, dear City Council members, I represent the Bronx Arts Ensemble and our many constituents throughout the great borough of the Bronx. Our mission is to bring music and related arts to Bronx schools and neighborhoods. We contribute to the cultures of our Bronx communities through live performances and innovative arts education that stimulate creativity, imagination, and aspirations. 
Those of us in the BAE family believe passionately in the transformative part, power of the arts to empower individuals and build inclusive communities. Each year we assist 5,000 public school students to learn art making at 40 schools, almost all of them in the Bronx, and that's through uh, CASA programs, so thank you very much City Council and DCLA, as well as an in-school uh, contract with the DOE. We also captivate audiences of over 15,000 at free community concerts in neighborhood libraries, churches, senior centers, galleries, and parks. In doing so, we provide employment to a diverse team of over 100 talented professional artists. New initiatives this year are a new partnership with the New York Public Libraries to form, perform children's musical theater at seven Bronx branches, 19 senior center concerts in the Bronx under the leadership and support of council members Torres and Gibson, um, an after-school education program to teach stringed instruments underwritten by Assemblyman Dinowitz to eventually build a Bronx Youth Orchestra. Uh, and I also want to give a shout out to Mark Joni, uh, who has uh, funded some summer uh, uh, concerts. One future aspiration is to deepen our commitment to our Bronx students through the creation of a weekend arts academy. Um, local art making is critical to community development. In today's economic environment, many jobs are being automated. Educators and business leaders appreciate that the arts spark key 21st century learning skills communication, creativity, collaboration, and critical thinking. We are grateful for the important role the City Council plays in supporting art making both in the schools and in our communities and respectively ask that it baseline its grant level for arts and culture in the coming budget. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jennifer? Hi. Uh, thank you, Chairman Van Bramer and members of the Cultural Committee for the opportunity. My name is Jennifer I. Cook. I'm the executive director of The Field, a 34-year-old arts service organization based in Lower Manhattan, serving artists in all five boroughs. Our vision for the future is to take the starving out of starving artists. It's ambitious, it's audacious, and we have a plan to achieve it. In 2018, artists generated $114 billion for New York State, yet the vast majority of the 57,000 artists who call New York City home live hand to mouth with inconsistent income, unstable housing, and no plan to pay off their debt or to map out a financial future. The vast majority of artists living in New York City are gig economy workers, renting in low-income neighborhoods with no savings and no retirement. With New York City's extremely high cost of living and very little income generation possible, artists cannot afford to live and work here for long term. Artists have to choose, be an artist or pay off your student loans, be an artist or own your apartment, be an artist or help your aging parents, be an artist or help your kids go to college. If New York City really wants to invest in its most vibrant income generating sector, artists are it. The arts and culture sector is it. In 2019, we did two national surveys and three focus groups in New York City with artists of color. 850 artists across the country and in New York City told us what they need to thrive, financial planning services. 850 artists across the country and in New York City told us that they need help with the student loan payoff and emergency savings. These are their number one priorities. 50% of our respondents have $50,000 in debt and they work freelance, part-time gigs without benefits or consistent income. They are struggling and artists from historically marginalized communities are struggling even more. In direct response to these struggles, the field is launching new services to take the starving out of starving artists to help artists improve their financial wellness and to plan for resilient financial futures. Our new services will help artists be artists and debt-free, artists and apartment owner, artists and saving money. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> David? Uh, hello, my name is David Johnston. I'm executive director of Exploring the Metropolis. And since 1982, Exploring the Metropolis has focused on solving the workspace needs of New York City's performing artists. Currently, we administer the ETM Con Edison Composer Residencies and the ETM Choreographer and Composer Residencies, which is taking applications as of this morning. Capping five years' work in the borough of Queens last August, we moved our administrative operations to a shared workspace at the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning in order to be closer to the artists and communities we serve. In the last decade, our residency programs have provided more than $1 million worth of no-cost rehearsal space and cash award to New York City artists. We've supported more than 100 composers and choreographers 
with free space and stipends, providing more than 50,000 hours of free rehearsal space. We have also supported more than 80 free public programs for thousands of New Yorkers. We have also had as our selected artists approximately one third of them are immigrants, residents of New York from Turkey, Singapore, Hong Kong, South Africa, Mexico, and Kosovo. Last year, we were happy to receive a sizable increase in Cultural Development Fund awards from DCLA. We ask that these increases be baselined in order to build upon the work of Create NYC. For FY21, we fully support increased funding for workforce development for the Cultural Institutions Group, including our partners at JCAL and Flushing Town Hall. We also ask the Council to remember that smaller organizations need increased funding in order to properly pay and retain our own workforce. Thank you to Councilmember Van Bramer and the Cultural Affairs Committee for the opportunity to testify. And we also thank Councilmember Van Bramer for his stewardship of this committee over the past decade. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to you all. Uh, our last panel um, is Kim Chan, David Chase, Sophia Allen, and Natalie Correa. All right, who wants to start? Yeah, I will. Go for it. Good afternoon. Begin. I'm David Chase, and I'm the Associate Director of Institutional Relations at Ballet Hispanico. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee for calling this hearing and for your support of New York City cultural community, and in particular, the Cultural After School Adventures Program. Ballet Hispanico is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. When it was founded in 1970 by National Medal of Arts winner Tina Ramirez, she sought to give voice to the Hispanic experience and break through stereotypes. She identified a need to provide Latino children with a more meaningful direction, a more certain future, and she would do that by giving them a safe place to go and teaching them to dance. Today, Ballet Hispanico is led by Eduardo Villaro, an acclaimed choreographer and former member of the company, whose artistic vision responds to the need for social equity, cultural identity, and quality arts education for all. Ballet Hispanico's arts education programs now reach nearly 12,000 New York City school children each year. From the beginning, education has been the backbone of Ballet Hispanico, and today, education continues to be embedded in all of our programs. The CASA program in many ways represents a continuation of our founder's legacy of providing after-school arts education to New York City school children. Ballet Hispanico is conducting residencies in 13 schools this year. The residencies use dance, choreography, and performance as the starting point and expand out to integrate these into other areas including cultural studies, history, and literature, thereby improving the student's overall academic performance and success. The curriculum for the program also draws from the New York City Blueprint for Teaching and Learning in the Arts. Ballet Hispanico's CASA programs provide a structured, nurturing environment of after-school programming for students, some of whom are critically underserved and thus might not otherwise have the opportunity to engage in focused and monitored dance activities. At, as Ballet Hispanico celebrates its milestone anniversary this year, it is deeply Thank gratifying you. for us to participate in CASA. We Thank love Ballet Hispanico, we love CASA. I want to recognize Councilmember Lanceman from Queens has joined us. He's here for the next committee, but I know he loves ballet and CASA, uh, just like anybody else. Next. Um, good afternoon, buenas tardes, everyone. Um, my name is Natalie Correa, and I'm a program assistant with National Dance Institute, also known as NDI. Um, NDI was founded in 1976 by New York City Ballet principal dancer Jacques Bamboise, and leads the field of arts education with a model program that has been studied and replicated worldwide. NDI's pedagogy, the NDI method, embodies Jacques' philosophy of joyful and rigorous learning for every child, the importance of teamwork and respect for others 
others, and the power of performance. At the root of the NDI method is the belief that the arts have a unique power to engage children of every background, ability, and socioeconomic position and motivate them to excellence in an environment of exclusivity. We utilize dance and music to instill in students a love for the arts, a passion for learning, and a desire to strive for their personal best. Our program also helps foster the social development, global awareness, and cultural literacy of our partners. NDI serves close to 7,000 children each week through our in-school program and brings a full year of dance classes integrated with live music to students at over 44 New York City public schools. Our classes are taught during the school day alongside core curriculum, placing dance and music on par with math and science in our students' academic studies. Since inception, we have reached over 2 million children free of charge. Alongside my colleagues, we wish to thank and acknowledge the City Council for its major increase in the NYC cultural budget over the past few years, but I remind you that it is important to maintain robust funding for our city's arts organizations. We ask the council to commit to increasing the budget going forward and to sp support smaller arts and culture organizations, which need increased funding simply to properly pay their current workforce and to attract and retain diverse work. Uh, uh, to retain a diverse workforce. Um, as NDI's founder Jacques Dembois said, the arts open your mind and and your heart to possibilities that are limitless. When the arts thrive, New York City thrives. Together, we are limitless. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great testimony. There's a lot going on here in the room, but yeah. uh, you. your voice was heard. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sophia Allen, and I'm here today as the Research and Advocacy Coordinator for Dance NYC, as well as an independent artist and dancer living in the city. So the work that I'm doing is to directly increase the impact of the work that we're here for today. And I'm also a direct recipient of that, of that work, of that impact. On behalf of the service organization Dance NYC, which serves over 5,000 individual dance artists and 500 nonprofit dance companies in the city, I join my colleague advocates working across creative disciplines and first and foremost thanking the council for the recent increase in the budget and requesting that the city baseline these increases to the New York City cultural budget for fiscal year 2021 and beyond as well as asking that the city allocate funding to workforce development within arts and culture sector in order to po properly pay, attract, and retain a diverse workforce that does not need to rely on multiple income sources in order to live and work in New York City. The ongoing affordability crisis in New York stems from long-standing systems of oppression and continues to exacerbate sector-wide inefficiencies that result from inconsistent funding commitments. Baselining the city's budget will counteract this by providing the necessary structure in which New York artists, cultural groups, and advocates have the necessary financial resources to move from a position of surviving to thriving. Locally, the increased funding is needed to ensure that the Department of Cultural Affairs and our city's arts and cultural institutions are positioned in a way to continue implementing the pressing recommendations from Create NYC's 2017 Cultural Plan and 2019 Action Plan. Dance NYC views these significantly as milestones and opportunities for advocacy. But we would like to remind the council that in order to reap the benefits of these plans, it requires consistent and collective action. With a vision for a sustainable, inclusive, and equitable sector in place, it is incumbent on the city to operationalize that vision through sustained intentional funding and nuanced prog pro progress measurement over time. Dance NYC strongly advocates for tracking the success of these strategies by creative discipline to ensure that dance, as well as all peer disciplines, are accurately represented and equitably served. Thank you. We love Dance NYC. Thank you. Last but certainly not least. Okay. Hi, I'm Kim Chan. I'm the Deputy Director at National Sawdust. We are an uh, artist incubator in Brooklyn that provides workspace for artists to rehearse, create, document, and perform their work for audiences and for New Yorkers to strengthen community bonds across cultures, musical taste, and differing backgrounds. The support we receive from the Department of Cultural Affairs and the City Council are essential components of our of everything that we do. Um, we are a women-led and founded organization. Our programs prioritize opportunities to empower women, non-binary, and underrepresented voices. Your support has helped us reach more than 20,000 audience members annually with more than 150 performances. Over 70% of the artists and audiences served are New York City residents. 
participating artists receive over 400 hours of workspace and over 540 hours of career development each year. We believe that artistic expression empowers all of us to create a more in inclusive world. And as an example, one participant in our arts education program, Student CoLab, has told us that um, I have learned that music is a safe place, that I can express myself without fear. And that is the kind of um, transformation that we seek for all of the participants in all of our programs. Um, this year's increased support has really helped us guarantee a higher level of um, quality and support for the participants in our programs. We are grateful for this funding and we do encourage you to continue the increased funding moving forward. Thank you very much. Uh, and I know that there's a public safety committee meeting right after this and the police commissioner is coming, but I kind of like it that a lot of folks uh, who maybe didn't intend to hear some compelling testimony from artists in the city of New York are in fact hearing about uh, and learning even more about just how amazing artists are, because there is no New York City without artists and culture and the arts. And uh, we have achieved record funding for cultural affairs and libraries in the city of New York, but there's more to be done. So I want to thank all of you for representing artists uh, across the city. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.